Welcome to the Ask Academy podcast. We are building that awareness. If you're running a business, marketing is a part of the business. Facebook ads and digital marketing funnels. Ali, what a some boy. Many rise, many jump. Simon Ali does a rock. <laughs> Five PM on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. All right, welcome everybody to today's live stream, to today's podcast. Um, honestly, I'm really excited to um, yeah have this guest on today because I think we planned it for some time and uh, yeah we finally uh, found the time that both worked for both of us and um yeah hi dan welcome to the show hello simon <laughs> thanks for having me man yeah man thanks for taking the time um so yeah for those people that do not know um can you give us yeah, a short introduction um what should people know about you so that they get a little idea who you are right now. Yeah, sure. So um, some of you may have heard of a platform called ManyChat, and um, I was the VP of growth at that company. Um, some of you might recognize my face from the uh, early YouTube videos when I was still figuring out how messenger marketing worked, and I, I taught the course with uh, Molly Pittman. So um, that was uh, that was a couple years ago, and um, I grew that company from about a 1,000 Facebook pages to 750,000 paying customers in, in two years. So we grew very quickly and um, it was an incredible thing. So at the end, you know, we, we were, we had no money at the beginning. And when I left after the first conference, uh, we were at a million monthly recurring revenue mm -hmm. subscriptions. So um, I uh, know quite a bit about subscription models. <laughs> Before that, I was at ConvertKit and it was a similar story. We, we had a, I was employee number one at a company called ConvertKit, which is a uh, email marketing platform. And we had launched that to kind of compete with MailChimp. And we very successfully stole a lot of their best customers and created a really cool company. So um, yeah, I, I have a long history with uh, early stage SaaS companies. And um, I just, uh, kind of dug into that about 10 years ago and have been down the rabbit hole ever since. Mm -hmm. So what I'm interested about, I, I warned you um, yeah, before we went live, um, excuse me, I'm really, yeah, no problem, that I'm really interested about, or not, yeah, interested about the, the whole subscription, as you said, as a, as a kind of business model, because from my perspective, there's a lot of pros and cons. Just when I see it as a, as a business owner, you have the, the constant revenue. Uh, if everything is work, it gives you a lot of security and things of that nature. On sure. the other side, um, yeah, you have to kind of deliver, improve constantly. Um, words like churn uh, will probably some, be something that, yeah, we have to worry about. So, um, yeah, so I'm really interested what you can share or what yeah after all the experience you, you had over at ManyChat and, and convert git sure. um, yeah maybe just from a from a yeah little overview perspective um what would you recommend to someone that says hey okay should subscription something that i should integrate in some way or form into into my business C certainly well first first things first cheers man um it's fun to be chatting with you i'm glad that we got Definitely. to this up. Yeah. and talking about some interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I would say about subscription models is that- German um, beer, by the way. I, I have to that's point right. that out, sorry. <laughs> nice pub beer. Yeah. Um, yeah, the thing about subscriptions is that everybody wants them. Yeah. And um, the reason why everybody wants them is because they have this sense that if, you, if I get somebody sub to subscribe to something, I have guaranteed revenue. And um, there are two sides to that story. Number one, that's categorically false. Um, most subscriptions in consumer businesses end after the first 45 days. So it's, or before the first 45 days. So it's like, um, just because you're charging a subscription doesn't guarantee that somebody's gonna keep paying it. And we can talk about that later. Um, but one of the really alluring sides of subscription models is that um, from a company valuation perspective, uh, subscription models are really favorable to banks and to venture capitalists and to private equity people. So when you're selling something, 
something on Shopify and um, it's a one-time sale and maybe you can use an upsell app to uh, get, an, get an upsell, uh, you're selling a physical product, that's the end of the transaction. There's really no future plan for that person to keep coming back and buying unless it's diapers or some kind of thing, which is a reusable, it's a re, it's, it's a renewable kind of need. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, some people in the subscription world figured out, let's do beard kits and razors and soap yeah, and yeah. wine. And so you see this group of subscription models for physical things that people kind of want over and over and over again. And those can, those can be really successful depending on what that recurring need is for somebody. Um, so that's how it kind of evolved in physical product space. But the real holy grail is to do something with software, do something that kind of augments human behavior with software, especially in business. And then instead of doing an on-premises build like they used to do in the old days where they'd come with a team and install the software on your servers and it would just be like mm -hmm. six months of nightmarish stuff and then they'd, they'd charge you half a million dollars. It's uh, with the advent of cloud computing, we can say, well, you, you could just access this application from your web app and um, we'll maintain all the servers. Actually, Amazon will. We'll just rent servers from Amazon and we'll keep our costs really low and pass those costs on to you and there's no on-premises stuff. So subscription models for software are really cool. And the reason why they're cool from a business perspective and from a banking perspective, finance more importantly, is that mm -hmm. bankers, financiers of all kinds are going to look at that and say, holy shit, you have people paying you month over month for something. And what I'm going to do since you have this intention, somebody, somebody says, I'm going to subscribe to this month over month, especially business software. Uh, bankers love to look at that and say, this is way better than an e-commerce business. This is way more interesting because we have a commitment to keep purchasing. And if we can grow quickly, that growth of monthly recurring revenue is way more valuable than growth of regular revenue. So to put it into terms of regular language, uh, a company that sells uh, toilet paper <laughs> is going to be valued at about 1 to 1.5x of their annual revenue, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you sell a million dollars worth of, of toilet paper per year, you're probably a million dollar business, maybe a million $500,000 business from a banking because perspective. You, you operate on a 10, 15% profit margin probably. Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. So so then there's no subscription model, so there's nothing to like beef up your valuation. Yeah. But if you're selling a toilet paper subscription, suddenly you could be valued at five to seven X what your annual revenue is. Because, because of people, commitment. Mm -hmm. because the bankers love to see that consumers are re-engaging, mm -hmm. and some of this is just an illusion. To be very honest, I mean, some some of these SaaS companies have terrible business models, but because they have people that keep buying, or at least they can buy customers from Facebook and Google very quickly, and keep those subscriptions churning, the growth curve looks very good. Even though they're losing customers every month, the growth curve is very good. So bankers will look at that business and see a better business than one that's been around for 50 years and has very good unit economics. So we're living in kind of a strange time, a very strange time in finance where hyper growth is valued more than sustainability. I mean, look around you in the world and you will understand how true this is. Hyper growth is way more valuable to bankers and to financiers than it is than anything else. So um, the, the, the hyper growth of a subscription business is just like the holy grail because there's pretty much no other business in the world that you can get the multiples on your valuation uh, so simply. Yeah, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. the fundamental premise behind why SaaS has been such an important thing for the last 10 years. So um, when I think back at... Um because I started my career in, in, in a bank, actually. So when I think back yeah. and when we evaluated companies and anal analyzed stocks, when, so general rule of thumb, and I mean, at that time, there was still something called an interest rate. We don't really have That's that right. today anymore. <laughs> but um, so a rule of thumb was, okay, you have a, the, a price earning um, ratio mm. of around 10, meaning, as you said, the, the company makes a million uh, revenue uh, per year. Um, then it's it's uh, uh, sorry, uh, not not revenue uh, earnings, uh, meaning a profit per year. Uh, yeah. uh, earnings per year. Then you um, can pay ten times the 
the price on on the stock market as a as a roughly idea. so is that something that would translate today into the SaaS world or are these numbers completely off or even more ex extreme yeah so i'm not a banking expert but i do, i've observed this trend very closely from a finance perspective and so my interpretation of what's been happening and i think a lot of really smart people will agree that earnings has become and, and earnings for everybody who doesn't understand the financial lingo it's it's uh earnings and revenue are not the same thing maybe maybe actually you could explain why they're different simon um, yeah, I'm always really careful when I, when I translate that into English so that I don't make any mistakes from um, from my from my German uh, banking education. But um, from to yeah, really really roughly said, you you have your revenue, then you have some form of cost. And uh, when you run a SaaS biz company, then they are not that high as you said. You have probably some yeah uh, service that run somewhere and um, yeah the, the stuff. And uh, yeah, what is left over that um, are then your earnings. And of course we have things like tax and depreciation, things of that nature, but to keep it yeah. really simple. So basically, yeah, the money that you take or that the company takes home um, at the end of the day, that's uh, these are the earnings. Exactly. Uh, did I so explain that uh, correctly that, in that's, English? That's, that's pretty good, man. And okay. I think that the, the emphasis, <laughs> yeah, it's good. The emphasis that I would put on it for the audience is Revenue is just the amount of money that somebody will pay you to do something. And then there's all these middlemen who want to take money, taxes. You have to pay your salaries. You have to you have to pay for the cost of doing business, like buying the servers and all that stuff. So earnings is a much smaller number typically than um, uh, revenue. So uh, that's really important for what I'm about to say. Because in the old days, businesses used to be categorized around this idea of profit margin and earnings. In other words, if you're spending $100 to get one customer and that customer is paying you $100, that's breaking even. As a matter of fact, you're probably losing money uh, by servicing that customer. So um, that wouldn't be considered a good business 20 years ago. But today, um, that, that, that could be a very good business from a finance perspective. And I'll give you a very clear example of this in WeWork. WeWork, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of it at least, is kind of an international um, office leasing company, I guess you could say. And uh, what they do is they buy big leases in really cool commercial spaces around the world, and then they lease it out on a per user basis to entrepreneurs and things like that. So the sun really just came out, so I look like I'm getting... Yeah, <laughs> that's, but, that's um, yeah, so, but, so a classic uh, real estate company, basically. Yeah, in it's a real estate company. Yeah, exactly. And people have been trying to do that for a long time, but WeWork you know, managed to do the right branding and the right message, and it worked out really well for them uh, for a while. But mm -hmm. then when you start to look at their economics, they, they released something called an S1, which is a, a bunch of financial disclosures that they have to give to the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States before they go public. Mm -hmm. So you hear about companies going public. Well, before, before a company goes from private ownership to giving stock out to the public to buy on the stock market, they have to go through a disclosure process. Mm -hmm. And one of the first steps that they have to take is something called filing an S1, which is just a form that the SEC asks for. And it's uh, that S1, I read it. It was one of the craziest things I've ever read in my entire life. It was just, it was nonsense. And the business model was terrible. They have to disclose all of their numbers too. And their, their unit economics were terrible. I think, um, I, I might be wrong about this exactly, but I think they were spending approximately four dollars, you know, in aggregate to acquire one dollar of revenue. So yeah. think of cost of acquisition. You have to spend money to get people to, you know, you have to spend money on Facebook ads or Google or where, whatever your 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 marketing people's salaries, your sales people's salaries. So they were spending four dollars just to get one dollar in revenue from a customer. That's crazy. It should be the other way around. You should be spending one dollar to get four dollars yeah. that would be amazing yeah. and so, then you may be still not profitable at that exactly point in a lot of business exactly. models by the way exactly <laughs> because of the expenses and the overhead exactly. and, and all exactly. kinds of things yeah. so they were scamming the whole world they were they were saying look at us we're growing so fast we're we're doing such amazing things where we've raised billions of dollars from from international investors and we're just changing the world. We're changing the whole world. And the truth is all that they were doing was trading uh, $4 for a quarter. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't make any sense. The, the unit economics of that don't make any sense. And I think that WeWork represents kind of the craziness that exists in finance today and the value, the craziness that happens in valuations today. So um, the, the, the kicker was that WeWork sells subscriptions. They say it's not just an office company. Mm-hmm. We're, selling subscri- we're selling subscriptions to individuals. And they took that model and the growth that they, I mean, the growth that they were able to achieve was astonishing. Imagine going out onto the, out onto the road to anyone and saying, I'll pay you $4 if you give me one dollar, everybody I, I would, would do that business with you. Everybody, all day long. Would, yeah, everybody <laughs> would participate in this. They'd be like, I can't lose. Yeah. So the thing is that that's how they grew so fast. They they grew by basically bribing people to to stay with the service, and yeah, that's yeah, not how yeah. you that's not how you create a sustainable business. So that's one extreme example of how the subscription model can be used to game the system and convince investors to spend billions of dollars bailing you out. Because when you're spending four dollars to acquire one dollar of revenue, where's the money coming from to keep spending money to acquire customers? Well, the only answer is borrowing money and raising more money from venture capitalists or private equity firms. So it becomes this crazy, deadly loop where the the, the faster you grow, the more money you have to raise because you're losing all that money. And yeah. then at the end, what do you do? The only way to way to go is to spread that risk out to the public via uh, an initial public offering, an IPO. And they were really hoping, I know Adam Newman was hoping to get through the, like slip through the cracks and Mm -hmm. spread that risk out to the global market so that it could keep keep the machine going. But unfortunately, a few people read the S1 and were like, what the hell, what the hell is this? What are you guys doing? So that was one example of where the system actually found a crazy thing that shouldn't be happening and actually fixed it. But a majority of those companies actually do end up spreading that risk out into the public market and the mm-hmm. public doesn't really know how this stuff works. So they think it's a great company, but it's actually circling the drain. So it's a very strange world. Finance is a very strange world and finance yeah, is cool. the prime mover behind a lot of these trends that you see, including software as a service. Yeah, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, there is probably sitting some banker or analyst and just looking at the numbers and uh, yeah. Yeah, no matter the story, um, someone exactly. is telling you. So um, maybe can you, and you can probably not go into details, but just from a, from a technical or from a conceptual perspective, um, yeah. maybe talking about uh, things like uh, venture capital and, uh, for example, what a series A is for, for people are listening. Because from, yeah. for example, in, in Europe or in Germany, there is not, that big of a VC scene that for like, for example, in, in the U S or, or in Israel or these kind of uh, things. And also in, in Jamaica where most listeners are more yeah, uh, sure. coming from. Um, so it's not yeah. that familiar. So maybe, yeah, you can, can share a little bit how that works, um, especially in, yeah, maybe the, with a tech background. Sure. Sure. Venture capital is absolutely fascinating because, um, it, it, it comprises a very small amount of trading in the world, actually, of, of microscopic. It's only like a couple of percent of GDP is represented by venture capital investments, yet it gets most of the recognition. It's because it's so sexy. You have these rich guys with their cool cars and their cool yeah. uh, houses and their neat office on Sand Hill Road. And you're like, wow, these guys, these guys have it all. They must, they, they know Mark Zuckerberg. They must be so cool. And it's just, um, it's the, the, that couldn't be further from the truth. That myth that people believe in is very cute to me, especially after being in this world for like 10 years and analyzing it and trying to understand what's really going on. I don't, I'm not trying to uh, take away your joy if you if you want to believe in that myth of the American entrepreneur. No, no, absolutely not. I think it's yeah. a kind of overhyped uh, yeah. a phenomenon in a lot of cases because um, these people want to make money. They are not so much interested in your vision or whatever their business model is. I take 100 companies on, I put whatever amount of them and 99% of them fail, but that one lucky shot yeah, refinances yeah. the rest of them. So I sure. think it's like everything in life and business has both sides. Um, but I don't know that much from practical experience about Series A and B and C. I know the the, the IPOs uh, from again uh, the, the banking background. Yeah, you're banking. Um, but uh, yeah, exactly. I don't know. Well, I think I know a handful, let's say, of of, of angel investors maybe in in Germany. But uh, yeah. 10 years ago, we just said high net worth individuals, meaning just people with a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, 
yeah, and I think in a lot of countries that's just not the case. And as you said, then people look at these at the scene or whatever with and probably yeah with movies and Silicon Valley and all that kind of stuff with a little 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 distorted uh, lens, maybe. Of course, and it's it's just one of these things that um, you know it's. What I'd like to do is I'd like to separate the science of venture capital from the religion of venture capital. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm trying to do when I approach it this way, because there's a distinct religious aspect to it. And then there's actually the science of how it works. And the science of how it works is not that interesting. It's actually quite boring. Uh, but I'd love to tell you about it because it's really important. And I think mm -hmm. it, it says a lot about the American culture and it says a lot about where finance is and where the priorities of people are. So... Um, the, the origin of venture capital is actually very, very cool. It's a very cool story and um, it's very recent. You know, this was a group, basically just a group of rich guys in California who were sitting around, being, you know, with this, this capital burning a hole in their wallet, you know, and they had gotten rich from technology ventures and they were sitting around in bars and restaurants in what is now known as Silicon Valley in the South Bay. And, um, they would go to lunch and they would talk about, oh, I met this kid who's building this thing and I gave him $20,000. Oh, really? Can I get on that too? So it started out as this angel investing club over lunch. These rich guys would get together and smoke cigars and eat expensive meals and just sit back and talk about these young kids they'd met who were building these crazy new things called personal computers. And um, they would spend a little bit of money here and there, kind of angel investing. And that, that got serious because a couple of them couple of those companies like turn into Xerox and um, and Dell computer and things like that. So um, those uh, those kinds of things tend to when they're when they happen at the right time, you have a bunch of passionate people with the right funding and, and leisure time and time to think about things and good food. You end up with a lot of creative juices flowing. And that was how venture capital started. It started very purely. Actually, it was just rich guys being rich, seeing if they could turn their capital into more capital by investing in young kids who knew more about semiconductors than they did. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually that became a very popular thing to do because these guys were making, some of them were making tremendous amounts of money because they were investing in people like Steve Jobs. <laughs> you know, these are the earliest venture capitalers. Yeah, capitalists. I heard about him. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> people have heard of this guy, I think. Yeah. So imagine early venture capitalists sitting around at lunch saying, we met this kid, Steve, and his his other weird friend, Steve, and they're making these things, and we don't really know if they're going to work, but every, all my friends at the supper club say he's really smart. We're going to give him $50,000. Uh, we're going to put him in touch with somebody who can help him with distribution, and that's how it started. Where things went off the rails, um, I think, for venture capital was when um, money got started getting really cheap. And um, this was a this is something that you tend to see is when money gets really cheap, it's really easy to borrow. And it's and you start to see these bigger players coming in, dumping more money into things as moonshots because they're like, well, we have money to allocate and we need to try something. And um, the world has gotten more and more networked since the computer age. So there's more information everywhere. There's more people who know about things. And as a result, more people wanted to be in on this cool game that only a few rich dudes in Silicon Valley were playing. And so you ended up with schemers. You ended up with schemers who had access to people's wallets coming into the valley. And uh, what, that, what that translates to is the, the very basic structure of a venture capital firm is actually very simple. The venture capitalists themselves, in most cases, aren't actually rich, rich guys anymore. They're just bankers. They're, they're fundamentally just bankers, whether they want to admit this to themselves or not. They're just bankers. And what they do is they actually do fundraising themselves. It's, it's in the old days when people were investing in Steve Jobs, it was a rich guy saying, damn, I'm sitting here on my yacht eating shrimp cocktail. And I really need to put a million dollars somewhere so that it's not um, depreciating. Let me give it to this kid and see what he can do. And that was how the arrangement went. Now, mm -hmm. in other words, that guy didn't have to raise money from anybody. He just talked to his accountant and said, can you free up a million dollars for Steve? Yeah. He had now, the money. Yeah, okay. He had the money. He had already made his money. Mm -hmm. And he just wanted to see, he wanted to play with it. Now, if you want to be a VC, you got to go raise a fund. Because most of the guys who do VC now, they don't start out rich. They're just eggheads. Or they're smart people who think they're smart and want to get into the game. So they go and try to raise a fund. Mm -hmm. And the people that they raise a fund from um, are generally people called limited partners, LPs. 
So uh, you have a venture guy and he says, you know, I'm, I used to be a founder. I'm a cool guy. I've got a great haircut. I've got a super cool YouTube channel. I'm going to start a VC fund. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to invest in, I'm going to do series A's and I'm going to only invest in companies that are like Pinterest because I want to see that hyper growth or whatever. So they go to their LPs because they have friends who are rich. They have friends of friends who are the uh, administrators for hedge funds. Uh, they have friends of friends of friends who are family offices and they go and say, we need to raise $10 million. And so they'll go to the pension fund and they'll say, can we have $5 million? And the pension fund will say, sure, you guys are in Silicon Valley. We're in Minnesota. We want some of that action. We'll give you $5 million from our fund, our pension mm -hmm, fund. Mm -hmm. And they'll, we'll become a limited partner. Basically, the only arrangement is we give you money with an expectation that you'll pay it back someday, hopefully, and maybe some more. And that's the kind of the end of the relationship. Uh, no so, voting rights or, or anything like that? Um, it depends on the fund. But really, okay. LPs are not in the best position most of the time. They're just they're silent partners in this weird little game. And okay. um, so LPs are, you know, if, if you if you look at 2008, I can give you that as a horrible example of where this game can go wrong because mm. a lot of limited partners in 2008 went bankrupt or lost 60% of their value. When you hear about the 2008 crisis, you hear about the real estate thing. And, exactly. and a lot, a lot, a lot crisis, yeah. yes, a lot less often mm. you hear about the aftermath, which is that um, people's 401ks, their retirement accounts, people who've been working for 30, 40 years already, their retirement accounts that had been sitting in a pension fund went down 60% in value. Guess who that pension fund was? Well, they were the LP and a couple of hedge funds or, mm, or other okay. places that had put okay. a bunch of money into speculative investments because they're like, I want to find the next Facebook. So mm. let's give you $10 million. But you're not going to find the next Facebook. That's not how it works anymore. So what that what, what ends up happening is in a lot of situations, the, v, the VCs will take money from any LP that, that's available to give it to them. They'll say, great, see you in five years. <laughs> and oh, by the way, I'm going to take a fee. So you, you, I've raised a $10 million fund. I'm going to take 2% as fees. Mm -hmm. that's, no matter what happens, I'm going to get paid 2% of this over the next five years to manage, just to manage the money. So yeah. this is something that I have to say. Um, you start, Simon, you started this conversation by talking about how it's that one company in 100 that does very well and pays back the fund. That's how it used to be, my friend. That's actually the okay. model that it used to be. The way that venture capitalists really make money is off of fees. And that's the thing that everybody should know if they're if they're getting into this game is venture capitalists really don't give a shit about carry, which is what that last that the first thing that we talked about is you get paid when the founders do well and they actually do well. They might get some money then. But these days, if you want to be a VC, you're chasing fees because fees are lucrative. You basically just get people to give you money to manage. And then if you do nothing you get paid 2% or something. It's crazy. Okay. So cherry, cherry on top, if you can invest in good companies and have a good story behind the money that you're spending. But uh, really, VC is about fees. And another thing that's really fascinating about VC is um, it rep it, it, the modern VC as compared to older VC back in the 50s, 60s, um, and 70s. 70s was a heyday of, of VC. That was when it really exploded. Um, what what's going on now is is more like a pyramid scheme or a ponzi scheme than it was back then and let me explain why let's just say i'm um uh, an angel investor okay and an angel investor is somebody like maybe somebody you know which who's a little rich just a little rich and they've got fifty thousand dollars to spend on a company yep. that they like they like the founder and they say you know what this guy's going to do something I'm going to, I'm going to just do a small transaction with him, give him 50 grand to see what he can do. Maybe he's, maybe he'll build something that's really cool. Maybe he won't. Um, I can afford to lose the $50,000. It doesn't matter. That's great. And, and God bless angel investors. Those guys are pretty cool. Um, they don't normally expect too much. Um, and they're very generous usually. So that's great. So I, I give you 50 grand or something and then it works. And then you raise a seed round. Okay. So the valuation of the company that I bought, you know, I, when I give you fifty thousand dollars, your valuation is this, right? Yep. We've we, I've decided that your your company's worth something. It's worth at least fifty thousand dollars. So I'm going to pay you some some money for it because uh, I want some ownership of this business if it does well. That's why angel investors invest. 
and uh, let's just say it does well, and then you raise a seed round of a million dollars. Well, suddenly, the angel investor is like, wow, this is great. I put $50,000 in, but now somebody else is putting a million dollars in and, and like boosting the valuation of this company. Mm -hmm. So now my, the $50,000 that I put in is worth some so a lot more than fifty thousand dollars exactly much, okay so that's the that's the cool thing that happens and then then it does really well it starts to grow and this is where something like a series a can happen so series a happens oh. when in, in in the modern market the series a is uh, just a term it's just a it's a it's a it's a term for a round of funding that happens usually after a seed round and it's the first big round of funding that you're going to do usually and it's usually led by an investor who specializes in early stage companies that are trying to scale. So series A happens when you've, you've come to this thing called product market fit. Hopefully you have recurring revenue or recurring revenue channels or a group of customers that really makes sense. And you just need more money to hire more people and build more tech to acquire more of those same customers and scale the businesses. So it's not about getting to the first customer anymore. You've already, you've already got your first hundred mm -hmm. customers. Mm -hmm. You just need to figure out how to get to the next thousand. So series A is kind of like this. Okay. You're a real company. Obviously you're doing something right. Let's talk serious. Let's give you some big money and let's get you going and scaling in the right direction. That's what series A is for. Mm -hmm. So a series A is cool. Um, let's just say you, you raise a $20 million series A, a $20 million series A is, is a decent series A. It's not even the biggest one that's happened um, in the last three years. And what does that mean for the other two guys that invested? Because you have a seed, a seed investor, and then you've got an angel investor. So what happens to the valuation of the company? You started with a very small valuation. The guy put in a seed round and boosted that, uh, that, that angel investor's money. Mm -hmm. And then the Series A guy comes in and boosts it even more. Oh, my God. Now we think your company is worth you know, a lot more. So we're going to give you $20 million for 18% of the company or 14 or 20% of the company or half the company. Yeah, yeah, so suddenly yeah. you're looking at a company that's worth, you know, let's just say they take half uh, for $20 million. They're saying that this, they're saying on paper, this company is worth $40 million. You follow yeah. that? Yeah, so, yeah, sure. so now this guy bought in at 50 grand and now the company's worth. Yeah, okay, I get it. So it's more like Holy shit. selling the evaluation to the next guy. So that exactly. the next thing, and, and the problem here when I, when I get it right is like, the shares of the new guys always, you know, shrink, 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 uh, more, more and more. And yeah, I'm sure. Then I get what you mean when you, when you're talking about a Ponzi scheme. So it's more like not so much developing the business, but finding a way to, yeah, raising, um, the next round, which at the, can make sense at some SaaS companies where you have a lot of investment and stuff at, at the beginning. But I think when it yeah goes in the wrong direction then uh, yeah it, it gets yes. derailed yeah okay so you're totally seeing the trend and i hope that a lot of your audience uh, is, sees it too which is that venture capital modern venture capital is about getting to the next funding round mm -hmm. so that the guys who got in before you can mark up their deal that's all it is and when exactly you build, you build an entire incentive structure around you coming in and marking up the last guy's deal guess what it creates a, a good old boys club is what we call it in the United States, mm -hmm. where you have uh, companies that raise money and you know who they're raising money from that guy's buddy. So the guy who did the series a guess who he's guess who he's going to go to, to help you raise money, his friends, because mm -hmm. he's going to say, guys, I've got this crazy good company. Um, you got to come check it out. This founder's amazing. He's going to be the next Elon Musk. You guys need to do the series B the buddies come in, do the series B series a gets marked up. Mm -hmm. And then you have a higher valuation. After, no value has been created. Like there's not, there's not better customers or better product market fit or like mm -hmm. better profitability uh, or anything. Yeah. yeah. yeah you no just can say after happened. evaluation now. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. On paper amongst a bunch of usually rich white guys at this point, they're sitting down saying, what should we make the valuation? I'd like to make good fees on my next uh, fundraising round. So what, this is how it works. Like they just calculate how, mm -hmm. how it's going to work for everyone. It's, it's like price fixing in normal markets. It would actually, in, in, in normal situations, it would be illegal because it's market manipulation, but it's, it's legal because yeah, you're in a private situation. So, that, I mean, I'm not joking. I mean, if you want to verify this yeah. for yourself, go read some books. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% with you because yeah. what when when you throw some numbers around with the 2% fee that, that they get and, well, 
and I, I don't want to name any, any names here, but a few years ago, I was in, in, involved or was asked for, for some advice in, in a, a situation like that, basically, um, where a startup and angel investor and they yeah, were looking for, for investors. But I didn't really understand the structure, the legal structure of the limited partners and, the part and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And it was kind of confusing to me. So but now when you're explaining to me and say, well, they get 2%, which is again from, from my, and again, I'm still registered as a financial uh, planner and advisor till today. So I know how hard and how transparent you have to be and how the regulations are. So for example, when you look at a normal wall street fund, where the big guys take your money and manage it, they, they get also, some, let's say 2% of, of the, of the cake. So yeah. that's kind of around the same, but when I look at the, um, rules let's say that the vcs or the private companies have to follow they almost non-existing rules then um and you brought the WeWork example um then i can see why it's so attractive to go for the two percent even if the percentage is maybe the same like the the money that i can make but the regulations and and the yeah the the complicated uh, nature of of doing it with the big companies or in a more regulated environment um, yeah. Okay. I, I think I get uh, what what yeah. you're saying here. Okay. Yeah, you get what I'm laying down here. Yeah. And yeah. So it makes sense. To bring this to a close, um, the real kind of strangeness about this all is that um, often the LP doesn't win, the limited partner doesn't win, but the mm -hmm. venture capitalist extracts a huge amount of wealth and fees through this whole process, while escaping a lot of accountability, while everyone else is taking on their risk. So. In my opinion, modern venture capital is a very asymmetric game where you have a very small amount of people who are benefiting a huge amount by forcing other people to take their risks. And this is actually a trend that you see throughout the, much of finance and throughout much of the economy is uh, many of the problems that we're facing right now as a society um, revolve around too few people Mm -hmm. holding too much power and making everybody else take risks. And uh, 2008 was a fascinating example of this. Again, during the pandemic, you saw um, Boeing get bailed out. You saw a couple of other big companies yeah. and a couple of other yeah. huge industries yeah. get bailed out by the government. Um, they were the ones who caused the problem, yet they're the ones who get rewarded. And it, it, it's, it, I'm trying to explain that this is, um, somebody thinks this is logical. <laughs> yeah. It's not logical, but because of the way that um, things have evolved in finance, it is logical somehow. It's kind of backwards, but that's the way it works. So to close out the venture capital thing, the holy grail is the initial public offering, because that's a way for a venture capitalist to get a little bit of money on top. To cash in a little bit. Yeah. Can take a cash in on the carry. Mm. And um, uh, another thing is that from a risk perspective, which is something I, I encourage you all to start understanding more uh, is risk and what you're exposed to. You have this company that might not be doing very well, but its valuation is really incredible. And the public market is very, very ignorant. The average consumer investor doesn't, they don't have conversations like the one we're having right now. They yeah. just invest in what other people are investing in. They see Elon Musk doing things and they're like, I'm going to invest in Tesla. They don't understand the unit economics of the business. They don't really understand the market that they're playing. They don't understand the game they're playing, but it sounds attractive. And it's a, it's an identity statement for them. I own Tesla. So they go and buy Tesla. And so my point to you is that, um, Tesla may or may not be a good security to buy, but the point is that we live in a world where the markets are crazy. The markets reward True. bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why they're so volatile right now because, um, well, things are going up like crazy because of the amount of money that uh, the Fed has put into buying bonds and things. But um, yeah, that's in the, the system. That we, live, we live in a very volatile system right now, and it's been happening for 30 or 40 years, and venture capital is just one very small part. Uh, but it mirrored the whole, it's like a fractal. When you mm -hmm. look at a small piece, you'll see the same patterns as you see it at the big piece. And that's how I yeah, that's true. big patterns that's was by true. analyzing venture capital. Uh, now, that being said, not all VCs are terrible. Like a lot of the, as a matter of fact, many VCs are the most decent people you'll ever meet. They're a little aloof because they're mm -hmm. rich and have no idea what's really going on in the world. But they're very kind people. They're usually actually quite generous with their time. They really want to help, but they're trapped in this game that rewards bad behavior. And 
um, they they want to win, so they're going to learn how to play the game very well. Mm -hmm. So um, it's I'm not this isn't a value judgment about the people who become VCs. It's more a value judgment of um, the system that we've created to incentivize growth, uh, which I think is fundamentally unsustainable. Yeah, I want to. Uh... Well, I have two thoughts and then you can decide where we want to touch first or at all. So sure, sure. very for, or earlier on in, in the conversation, um, you, you made a comment. I can't really remember it uh, right, but it triggered the kind of thought in my head, like, okay, how realistic is it um, as, a, as a startup um, that is looking for that kind of funding to actually become successful because in my head i see companies like alphabet slash google and their yeah. vcs or whatever and yeah. they're buying power they are much quicker they have a probably more long-term perspective and really interested that the that the startup or something um yeah. is, is being successful from that perspective but also from another perspective meaning is there any real competition for these companies because when Google or Facebook or whatever, you can replace it in, in, in every way or form here, the name of the company when they see, oh, that kind of company is good or a competitor or whatever, they just buy it. I mean, yeah. or is that, is that the wrong thought from, from your experience? Yeah. Um, so no, it's, it's a really good topic to touch on because, um, to bring it, to bring this conversation down to earth, well, sometimes it's great to raise money because you need to be able to experiment and you need a runway, you need some some room for error. And um, sometimes you don't have the ability to create something right away that people want to pay for. And um, venture capital can give you that buffer zone where you can take some time to figure it out and hire the right people. And it can be a very creative process um, and it can lead to a lot of amazing breakthroughs. Uh, but it usually doesn't. I, unfortunately, you only hear about the ones that survive and do very well. Uh, you don't hear about the thousands and thousands of companies that raise millions of dollars every year that completely fail. Yeah, survive because uh, there are literally th tens of thousands of them every year. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, about yeah, it, this is this is a topic that we man. There's so many different ways we could take this, but um, the way the way of venture capital is. Um, I'll, I'll start by making a recommendation. If you can bootstrap, do it. Um, Money is very cheap right now. You can get venture capital from all over the place. People are just throwing money out of the window right now to try to find the next growth stock or try to find the next growth company. Because money has been so cheap, the interest rates have been so low. And as a result, you have hedge funds, you have family offices, you have limited partners, all these different people who have tons of capital to allocate. They couldn't spend the money fast enough over the last five years. So it's probably easier than it's ever been in the history of venture capital to, ra to raise money right now. That being said, the kind of stories that venture capitalists are buying right now, and I'd like to emphasize stories, because venture capitalists don't buy companies, they buy stories. This is something that I learned over the last 10 years by watching it happen, mm -hmm. is you could have a very a vastly inferior product that doesn't really even function. But if you have an amazing story about why it's going to work and you talk to the right people who want to believe in that story with you, you can raise money from them. So this is another thing that um, I would I would emphasize, which it's a very human thing to want to buy stories. We're all collectors of things, aren't we? Like whether we want to admit it or not. And you want to part, be part of something. Yeah. We want to be part of something bigger. Exactly. Yeah. And the thing yeah. is that venture capitalists are humans. And they're often extremely insecure humans. They're insecure, middle-aged white men who thought that money would buy them the perfect wife and house and that they'd be very happy, and they're not. And they're like, well, shit. <laughs> so I'm gonna connect with I'm gonna connect with founders. I'm gonna be a father figure. A lot of them mm, okay. are proxy father figures for the people that they invest in who are primarily oh. white and Asian men. So um, it's a very psychological process. This isn't just some mechanical thing you can put in a spreadsheet. My friends, everything in life is about human relationships. It, that's that's all. That's what it comes down to. If if you can analyze everything through the lens of human relationships, you'll actually have a more accurate representation of reality than if you're trying to look at everything through the structure of how one piece fits to another piece. Like um, women already know this, and sadly, there's not enough women in this industry to counterbalance this. But women already see the interconnectedness of everything. They're naturally inclined to see how one story weaves into another. Um, 
men don't do this very well. We compartmentalize and we put things into boxes that are very sharp edges. And uh, that's, that's really a really great true. way to hide problems, actually. Because yeah. if one thing is separated from the other, you can just focus on this without focusing on this. But the a more feminine way to approach things is to say, approaching this is approaching this. They're the same. You're just looking at it from a different angle. So try to look one thing. If there's one thing you can take away from this chat, anybody who's listening is try to look at things as if everything is connected because it really is. And things are way more complex than you would think. And it really all comes down to human needs at the, at the end of the day, people do things completely irrationally to try to solve for some pain inside of themselves every day. They, that's the decision-making process that most people make. I have something that I feel I'm missing. So I'm going to do things in my life to try to fill that. And sometimes I'll get smart and realize what I'm doing isn't working. And sometimes I'll double down on what I'm doing uh, because um, I don't know, I don't know better. So VCs are just people and they make decisions irrationally. And uh, for you as a, person trying to raise money from them if you understand that you're talking to an irrational person who just wants to be loved and appreciated and and wants to be the person who everybody's looking at and says oh you're so smart you you invested in these guys you're such a genius if you understand that psychology you have a better chance of raising money than anybody else in the room even if you have a in inferior product because you're playing their game <laughs> does that make sense yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, and there, there is a, um, I hope I don't butcher the, the pronunciation, but in finance, there's a big, and over, I think, the, the last 10, 20 years, um, really, really big part of, of finance um, is the part of behavioral finance, because people understand there is no such things like the, the what's it called, the homo, homo economicus. I think that the yeah, theoretical yeah. model of the logical human that always, com yeah, uh, uh, kind of okay price and risk and makes a rational decision um and that just not how how reality and and financial or business decision um are made so uh, yeah makes 100 percent sense uh when when you're talking about vcs or investors in general um as as humans yeah absolutely I think, true. I think that makes sense 100 yeah. so so if you've got some audience some people in the audience who may be listening to this and thinking uh, I need to raise money. I've got a good idea. I need to raise money. Well, that might be true that you need to raise money, but I would challenge you, number one, to ask yourself, do I really need, is money the problem here? Is money the thing that's preventing me from growing something to getting this in front of people, to getting people to test what I've built? And if the answer is no, and I guarantee you, if you look deep enough, you'll realize that the thing that's holding you back is a little bit of work. You usually just have to do some work, build something, even if it's a small version of what you think it needs to be, and then put it in front of people to see what if, if they'll buy it, if they're if they want to give you feedback or not. Um, that's really difficult. It's actually way easier to raise money than it is to do the hard work of getting something in front of other people. So you might fall into a mental trap of saying, I can't be successful because no one's going to give me money. I'm in Jamaica. Who cares about Jamaica? My question to you is, do you really need money to get to the next step? And I guarantee you, if you look a little bit deeper, you might find there's some small version, some sliver, some small piece of what you want to do that you can actually do by yourself or with your wife or with your partner uh, and give it a shot and see what happens. And you're going to learn more from doing that process than you would ever learn from a VC. Uh, so I would really encourage you to don't let the people make decisions for you. That's what VCs want to do eventually. You know, they give you money, but yeah. there are strings yeah. attached. You have yeah. to make the, the, you're, you're also giving up your own autonomy. Take the risk yourself, especially if you're young. Maybe there's some people in here who are a little bit older who have children who can't afford to take such big risks. But if you can afford to take some time away and build something and put it in some in front of somebody, your your life will never be the same. You will have changed your own world by doing that simply because you can now look back and say, okay, we built something and shipped it and put it in front of people and everybody hated it. But I learned so much. <laughs> I learned so much. During the process, yeah. And nobody can give you, money will never give you that experience. And you'll become a richer person simply by doing that. Um, and I, I can speak from experience uh, regarding that. Yeah, I would 100% agree here. And I think that's something that, that we also preach a lot, that whenever possible, of course, there are some business models where you need some funding or we need oh, some course. capital. Yeah. But um, yeah. whenever possible, I think bootstrapping, 
um, is the way to go. Because I think a lot of people romanticize, as you said, um, like, oh, it's free money. No, it's not free. It's come with a price and it comes with, as you said, with strings attached in yeah. some way or form. You're giving away part of your company. You're giving away yeah. part of your independence, whatever it might be. Yeah. And um, I think that's something um, yeah, that, that yeah. people need to be aware of 100%. Yes, to put a really fine point on it, people, um, if you want to play the venture capital game, and this isn't always the case, but if you want to play that game, generally speaking, you've decided not to be a business owner, actually, because when you do venture capital, you are now just a vehicle through which bankers are transferring wealth. That's all that you are. And everything that you do has to support that mission or you will become irrelevant. So like... The thing is, if you build your own business, you can do it for your own reasons and you don't have to, the, the wealth transfer can be happening to you. You can sell something and, and make some money. If you go into this VC world thinking, oh, I'm going to raise a million dollars and make the next best thing and people are going to buy it and then we're going to go IPO. That expectation that you're putting on yourself is so unfair. It's just really unfair. And Silicon Valley wants you to believe that you're special, that you are the one in a billion person. And the fact is, putting that pressure on yourself leads to insane overwork. You give away way more than you would normally give away. You make compromises that you never thought you would have to make. And sometimes you end up kind of in a worse situation than you were before. And I know a lot of people who raised money, a lot of dudes who raised money, who ended up building something that they fucking hated. They hated it. Mm -hmm. They were like, why am I doing this? I'm five years into this business. It's not even what I started. I, my wife left me because I was working too much and I was cheating on her because I was so stressed. Like, I'm not saying that that's going to happen to you, but this whole wonderland that if you start a company and raise some money, you're going to go make a billion dollars on the open market. That is so unbelievably rare. And it has nothing to do with you. The people who get to that point it's a confluence of maybe getting a product right, but also having a tremendous amount of luck. And when you put yourself in the position where the only thing you will accept from yourself is if you get tremendously lucky, finally, you'll be happy. That's, that's such a horrible burden to place on yourself. I will only be happy and feel rich if I get tremendously lucky over the next 10 years. It has nothing to do with me. A bunch of random, very good things have to happen to me or else I'm miserable. Like I, 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 I challenge you to, I challenge you to let that go, man, because there's so much good you can do in the meantime on a smaller scale, on a more local scale that will bring you fulfillment. And that's not something that you're going to get from sitting in a boardroom with VCs. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you here. So what, what I'm interesting or, or thinking about because I, yeah, until a few years ago, I wasn't really aware of that goal um or or idea of a lot of startup founders or whatever of like okay what what is the exit you know that that exit exactly. strategy and then selling yeah. the company because Holy concept. maybe i'm naive but in yeah. when i grew up or the companies the brands that i know in in germany in europe these are most of them are family owned or at yes. least they, they started out um like that at some point That's in true. time and then over generations usually i think this, the third generation fucks it up because then yeah. <laughs> they are too rich and then too lazy and then yeah yeah, I have the money. I don't need the stress. Yep. Um, and then, I don't know, commit suicide or some other. Anyway. Or they sell out. Yeah. 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 So, um, but but so that's kind of the, the world or how I know it. So what, what is your, is it like shows like, what what is it? The Not Shark, uh, Shark something uh, where they fund. Shark companies. Tank or something. Shark Tank, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And we have the, the other versions in all over the world now. Is, is that something or where do you think is that exit thinking? and making that bunch of money coming from, because what are you doing then? I mean, are you sitting yeah. only on the beach and doing nothing? Or, I mean, yeah. you need some purpose in life and then sure. again, producing something, doing something, or yeah. I don't know what, but. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, let's tackle that one at a time. Let's talk about these stupid TV shows, these silly, silly TV <laughs> shows, um, which evolved from reality TV, which is another very, it, you couldn't be further from the truth uh, that it's reality. Um, you know what these shows are? Is they're 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 freak shows. They are um, they're talent shows. They're what they're designed to do is entertain. And when you see the guy who has the cool new skateboard gadget and he gets up and he pitches these people, and Mark Cuban says, "I want half your company. I'll pay you a million dollars." 
You know what the reality is? Is that the guy who created that skateboard thing did it out of passion. And he was an engineer and he quit his job and went into huge amounts of debt, took a second mortgage on his house so that he could build this thing. So even if you gave him a million dollars right now, he would be paying off $650,000 in debt. So at the end of the day, um, he's getting $200,000 and then he's paying 33% taxes on that. And then at the end of the day, he made one year's salary <laughs> as a good engineer. Uh, and gave up 30% of, yeah. of his company. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to sell it to private equity for a lot more money, or they're going to do something else with it and spin it out, or they're going to basically extract as much value from it as, as possible. And the, the that guy who put his life into building the stupid skateboard thing, he's not going to see much money after that initial payout. That's the that's That's by design. These guys buy up undervalued things to spam them out into the market and see how much money they can make. And that's the, that's the end of the deal. And also it's about marking up the last guy's deal. They go into the same cycle that the VCs do, except in private equity. So my point to you is this, they glamorize, oh, we're going to give you a million dollars for your idea. And what I would challenge you to do is look past the fun aspects of that, that heart racing moment when they're, they're talking to you and you, you think they're going to choose you. Oh, I'm finally good enough that these people who are very rich are going to choose me. My point, the point that I'm trying to make right now is that the reason why people watch these shows is because they want to be chosen. We all want to be chosen. We all want to be validated for how good we are, how smart we are. We want to be told we have good ideas. We want somebody to give us money for our ideas because we want to believe that they're valuable. And the thing is that if you really break down some of these transactions and if you go back and look at the reality of these people's lives after they sell out, many of them regret it. Many of them openly regret it. And many of them are actually in a worse financial position than they were before. So my question to you is like, would you rather own a small thing, 100%, that you feel you have a connection with and that you're moving with the strength of your own self? Or would you rather own 5% of a really big thing and be irrelevant? And that's that's the question. It, neither one of those is the correct answer, but um, it depends on who you want to be in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think you're a lot of a lot of true stuff that you're saying there, especially with the with the motivation behind why why people are doing that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the even as you said the, the chosen ones, if you want to call them yeah. like that, um, are not that happy because well, yeah, yeah, as I said earlier, also the ones that that I had contact in in Germany that yeah. got the funding and stuff doesn't mean that you're necessarily um, yeah successful successful at the end of the day or even yeah make make yeah. money out of that deal. That's exactly yeah. true, and, ta and taxes taxes find their way to eat up a lot of your eat a lot of your fun, as you know. Um, and, and so let's bring it back to um, the exit, the myth, the mythology of the exit, which is another one that I just, I wish more young people, and I fell for this too. The reason why I'm so, uh, I have such a strong opinion about this is because I'm thinking compassionately about my young self 10 years ago. I got into this game hoping that I would be chosen, that I'd be the one who figured everything out and I'd be so smart and you'd give me give me $10 million and I would do everything right. And I'd be a millionaire and I'd be able to buy a house and go away from everyone and not have to talk to anyone ever again. That was my goal, you know? Yeah. Um, and the thing is that that's what a lot of these, that's what a lot of this is all about is we, we're scared of each other. <laughs> we don't communicate very well with each other as a species. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity and we fundamentally don't have a lot of control over our lives. We like to think that we do, but everybody knows that there's life is a bit of a grind. And we, we want to believe that it, there's something that we can achieve that will separate us from the reality of life. Maybe if we get a lot of money, we can buy a perfect place where we can just push the world away. Uh, we can buy that perfect car where we can be special in our little bubble and the rules of the road won't apply to us because we're driving a Lamborghini. And when you're in a Lamborghini, speed limits don't exist. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter. Yeah. You can afford you can afford the speeding yeah. ticket. Fuck it. We're all trying to buy our way to a place where we are separate from the laws of nature. If you look across the, the globe, you look at a lot of these rich folks, they have compounds. They have places 
in remote areas that run on their own power that are completely separate from everybody else. That's how scared they are of the world. And they think that money is going to solve the problem. Maybe it will for them. Maybe when the world ends, they can go to their stupid bunker in New Zealand and drink champagne for the rest of their life until all the all the plants die and the the earth is so polluted they can't breathe. But they'll have a they'll have a lot of nice champagne all alone in their concrete bunker. Like, here's my point: the exit is a nihilistic and fundamentally cynical point of view. It is saying. I'm going to work really hard and subvert so many different people. I'm going to say, fuck you. I'm not going to collaborate with you. I'm going to hoard all this effort and put all this effort in by myself. And at the end, I'm going to reap all the rewards and leave all you fuckers behind. You guys can stay here on this stupid dying planet. I'm going to go to Mars with my billion dollars. Like the exit, the, the, the lust for this moment where you have so much money that you don't have to follow the rules of the world anymore is an illusion. It's just fundamentally an illusion. You can talk to some of the people who've achieved this, and you know what? They go right back into the same game they were playing before. Like one of my favorite people in the market right now is a guy named Chamath Palihapitiya, and I would okay. encourage you to look him up. He was the he was the VP of growth at Facebook uh, and a mentor of mine, and somebody I really really look up to. And he grew Facebook from basically nothing to a billion users. He was the guy oh. who did that. And um, he he was he's just a brilliant dude, and he made a lot of money selling Facebook shares. And you know what he did? He didn't buy a compound and then go become a subsistence farmer. Yeah, you know, he didn't start raising goats and living with his kids. He did a he did, raised a venture fund and became a, an investor. Like my point is that this quote unquote exit that people are looking for is almost always an illusion. You you are. You, you're in the game you're in for a reason. And if you think that money is going to take you out of it, you're wrong. You're just wrong. All you're going to do is you're going to have a lot of money and the same drive to keep playing the game you're playing. And often more money brings a lot of more, a lot more stress because then you have to manage the money. And <laughs> the situation that we're in right now, Simon, as you know, with interest rates, if you're holding on to cash right now, you're losing money every month. Like yeah. if you're yeah. holding on, if you're holding cash in your hand, you're, you're literally, you're just like, you're burning cash. You have to be investing it in something that will grow if you just want to hold on to the value that you already have. So the more money you have, the more that equation becomes scary when you're holding a billion dollars and you're not, you're nominally losing 3% of that per year. That's, I mean, that's insane. That's like putting your money in a savings account and they they take money from you every month. <laughs> That'd be oh, crazy. That's... And well, that's not so crazy anymore because yeah. uh, we have de facto negative interest rates in, in yeah. Europe and in, in, in Germany right now. Well, they don't call it like that. They call no, it uh, fees for whatever you have to have yeah. them on, on your savings account. But you're yeah. right. As soon as you have a certain amount of money on your account, you you now have to pay uh, yeah. for it. Yeah, Just to service the account. So exactly. my point is, my point is that if you're looking for an exit, I would challenge you to understand what it is you're trying to buy yourself out of. And if you're trying to buy yourself away from the, the real world, good luck. I promise uh, you'll have a good time for a few days, and then you'll realize that everything falls apart, and um, you still have to find love and affection and growth in the world, and money can't buy those things. Yeah, that's true. Is it okay to um, for you to answer a question from the audience about uh, Airbnb and that it's uh, now going public? I think that kind of fits um, the topic. Yeah, sure. Now. Sure, sure, sure. I just put it in here so you can read it by yourself, but I read it for everybody listening in the podcast. Yeah. The question is, what do you think about the business model of Airbnb and the fact that it's now gone public and uh, yeah i think especially in a certain situation with <laughs> traveling yeah. and the tourism industry not uh, at their prime time right now yeah sure um first of all wonderful question and thank you for submitting it uh it's a very insightful question and it's very pressing because this is happening as we speak um yeah. let's talk about airbnb as a business model and uh, airbnb is a interesting company for one reason more than others in my opinion because it started out really pure it started out as a bunch of kids who, who were trying to solve a problem for themselves 
and it turned into a service for solving problems for other people. And it was so popular that it grew and grew and grew and grew. And um, it exposed a lot of problems with the hotel industry. That's what Airbnb did. I think more than anything that I'm interested in right now in my life is looking at Airbnb as this strange mirror that the hotel industry had to finally kind of like look at itself and say, oh my God, we've been doing a lot of things wrong for a long time. Our pricing is weird. Our flexibility is weird. Uh, the fact that we're not that fun anymore is weird. <laughs> like the fact that hotels are basically a commodity up to a certain point and then you have luxury and there's very little in between. Uh, the fact that it's a, it's a world of extremes was exposed. And I think that that forced the hotel industry to be smarter, which is really interesting to me. Um, Airbnb also democratizes uh, property ownership in a way because you can now just be a person who uh, can't really afford a house, but you know with a certain degree of certainty in certain markets that if you get that mortgage that you really can't afford, you'll probably be able to cover the payments if you do an Airbnb. So that actually brought a lot more people into buying houses or getting mortgages as a result. And that could be a good thing and a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. So it gave more people access to property ownership, which is a really interesting concept to me, you know? Um, but that being said, when you, when you get as big as Airbnb has gotten and you get to the point where it's really just about getting numbers, uh, customer service goes away. Um, accountability goes away. Um, fraud goes up and things like that. And, you know, what, one thing that Airbnb enabled that I think a lot of sharing economy um, type applications enabled was just a lot of mediocrity, to be perfectly fair. Now, I'm coming at this. Uh, my wife, Sharon, is half German. She's very precise, but she's also half Puerto Rican, so she's very sassy. But she's very professional, and she loves things to be very clean and square. She's been a very high-end catering manager for, for years and years, for more than a decade. And she puts on the most exquisite events for companies like Nike and Google and, and all kinds of really small nonprofits and things. And the precision and beauty and grace that she brings to events is just inspiring. And I love this old school idea of service. This old school idea that you walk into a hotel and you're just some schmuck and you're greeted as if you're royalty and everything is nice and everything has been placed properly and there's just this aesthetic that i really love about old school with hotels. the concierge and all the three yeah exactly there's something beautiful about that because it's about service it's about it's about indulgence it's about something that many people don't really have a lot of access to uh, especially in their own homes and then you go into this environment and somebody else has taken care they are taking care of you that culture was lost with airbnb it's not about caring it's really about pricing Yeah, that's right. And that's that's something that happened with Airbnb that I'm a little bit sad about, which is that, you know, you ended up with people who couldn't afford their mortgages, putting Airbnb on their property, and just charging whatever they could charge for it just to pay the mortgage. It's not about customer service or the the delight of the the space anymore. So this is a side effect. A side effect of this more people getting into mortgages. What does that mean? It means that demand for mortgages goes up demand for property goes up. So I've seen, I, I used to live in Portland, which is a very popular city for Airbnb. And um, the rent prices in Portland, I saw them over the period of time that I lived there almost double in a period of five years. Oh. And a lot of, a lot of this was population growth, but a lot of it was Airbnb. Airbnb in certain markets will actually inflate property costs because they're able to charge these unbelievable premiums because you can go to a bungalow in Portland and hang out and drink coffee. And, you know, you might see modest mouse walking down the street. So the, the point is that Airbnb has also been a force of economic destabilization in many, in many cases. It's, it's, it's allowed people to make an income from selling space, but it's also been a place for a lot of speculators to get in just to try to make some money. Yeah. And so the business model, Intrinsically, there's nothing wrong with it, but the behavior that it is enabled has destroyed some communities in Portland. It's destroyed some communities in LA. It's caused a huge amount of property damage throughout the world. It's caused a lot of strange new types of legislation about homeowner rights and things like that. Because, uh, you know, in New York City, for example, there were a lot of people who realized that um, I, I shouldn't be having tenants. I could be making way more money. I own an apartment building. I should just make the whole thing an Airbnb and charge twice 
the nightly rate and make way more money. So it causes a housing crisis in some parts of the city of New York. So like my point is that uh, Airbnb is a two-edged sword. It allows a lot more people to play the real estate game and it allows a lot more people to play the real estate game. So you end up with inflation in different parts of the equation. Yeah. So it's not all good. So ethically speaking, I'm not for Airbnb. I think it's a fascinating business. I think it's one of the one of the hallmark businesses of the 21st century. I would never buy it. I think it's tremendously overvalued. And I think that at this moment, you can see if you just keep your eyes open that um, the hotel industry is in trouble, the travel industry is in big trouble, that all it takes is a little tiny virus to ruin the entire economy and the entire travel economy. So do you really want to be invested in something where the value of this thing fluctuates daily based on whether people are able to travel or not. I think there's better businesses to buy, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah so first of all, uh, thanks for the question and thanks for your answer. Um, and I think you were, you were absolutely right. Um, and that's also true in Jamaica, as far as I can tell, because when I look back over the last yeah, years, it's really like you said, a lot of people got into Airbnb as a yeah, way of, of making money on the side or not on the yeah. side but yeah you have a house and then you rent it out and whatever kind of model you you choose mm -hmm. and um yeah especially right now with uh, yeah, all the as you said tourism and all the traveling are basically going down to zero um yeah there will i mean yeah you you mentioned the the subprime crisis uh, or the real estate yeah. crisis in 2008 so um yeah that's something that can certainly be uh, accelerated through through such events. And I think yeah. especially when you then have a mortgage to uh, refinance uh, for something yes. like that, then you have a domino effect. And um, yeah, as you said, it's a, a two, uh, what is it, two sword, no, what's the saying? Two-sided coin, that's what yeah, I mean. Exactly. Not that's exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I generally, I generally want to stay away from things which are intrinsically speculative. And I think that if you look at the vast majority of people who have Airbnbs, um, they're way over leveraged. They're individual people who have way too much debt and they're using Airbnb as a way to try to keep control of that debt. That's a desperate equation. And so they don't care about your comfort. They don't care about accountability. They just want you to pay them so that they can service their debt so they can keep their house. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, if you're in that situation, you're not, number one, you're not going to have that great of an experience. And number two, it degrades the whole the whole ethos of hospitality, which is more esoteric and more philosophical, but I really do believe in good service and eh, it's just not for me. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. I think, um, as you said, uh, one or the one customer is more for the, the experience and the service and things of that nature. And the other one mm -hmm. just looks for literally the mattress on the, on the ground as it yeah. started. And Precisely. Like, yeah. 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 So, exactly. yeah. Well, we will see uh, how this is going to play out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the whole thing. Anyway, um, I want to, or is it cool when we talk a little bit about the whole messenger and maybe I, I share a little bit about my experiences when, because I started honestly with, with many chat, uh, my first uh, experiences yeah. Uh, yeah. with, with all the messenger. Yeah. A lot of people are your 100%, right? Um, because and yeah, I'm also and then we can maybe talk about Thomas a little bit if you sure. if you want to. Yeah. Um, so um, I would love yeah. to, but would you give me one second? I need another beer. <laughs> would you excuse Come me on, for, for just sure, for sure. excuse me, folks? I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So in the meantime, while Dan is getting his beer. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the conversation so far. Um, if that's the case, f feel free yeah, to give the show a like, a thumbs up, whatever yeah, social media platform you are right now. And of course, feel free to share it um, with someone that you like. And you always can drop your questions or your comments, your thoughts in the chat, in the comment section. And then I will try to um, yeah, put it in the live stream and um, hopefully we find the time that Dan can answer it. All right. Ah, thank you so much for obliging me. Oh, so, get yeah, that little satisfying. Perfect. See if you can hear it. Ah, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah it was good. 
course, definitely. <laughs> um, so yeah, ManyChat. Um, yeah. Let me think. I think yeah. I think when when I started out with with or let's let's say with with messenger marketing, um, I thought it was a really great uh, idea, really great uh, product because I really liked the idea of that yeah more personal interaction and um, yeah really the simplicity of it of building the triggers and, and, and that mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but also from a strategic perspective, I saw it in a yeah, let's say not not in a customer service way that that's maybe the the wrong way to put it, but more as a kind of bridge thing. So to to yeah, put a lot sure. of work that is maybe not necessary for a human, and then bridge it or yeah, move it move it forward, move it forward to to of a course. human connection. Yeah. Um, what I saw nonetheless um, over the years um, was more like um, yeah, I not well yeah i spam people and try to sell them shit as much as i can and get in their yeah. inbox which is especially yeah. in the us where a lot of people use <laughs> facebook messenger i think a uh, way bigger thing than it was for example in, in other countries um, where facebook messenger is maybe not that um, common um which then resulted over time with privacy uh, privacy uh, issues in uh, in uh, europe and the gdpr mm -hmm. stuff and all these kind of things that it from a yeah just business use case it lo yeah lost more and more attract attractivity i don't know if that's a word but yeah um and i don't know when exactly that was but when i remember correctly um and you can maybe help me here um when i think when managed then announced their series a funding um that was yeah. kind of the moment when they also um, implemented the, the sms feature and mm -hmm. um, email and kind of that yeah we go more into the complete messenger come platform was something and i can't really 100 remember yeah. um and honestly since then besides a complete passive approach meaning you have it kind of set up and and yeah when someone reaches on your website or, or reaches out on your facebook page or things of that <laughs> nature then you have some response set up um right. but besides from that i don't really see a yeah but maybe maybe that will change in the future but but that's kind of the the status quo um that that we have right now uh, so yeah in the past a lot of clients and and we use it and it was a really helpful um tool not so much in the yeah, active uh, outreach and then prospecting but more in the you know, kind of getting customer service and, and, and things of that nature done sure um yeah, so that that's my uh, experience um, from user or customer side of yeah. many chat. Um, yeah, so I think you left. Or when did you left many chat? I, I don't really know. Yeah, where where the time frame? Yeah, is but that's that's kind of my uh, what sure. I remember so far. Yeah, well, your story is not um, uncommon. To be perfectly honest, uh, I think that's there was a period of time where there was a bit of a golden age. There was a rush. There was a lot of excitement. Um, there was a lot of potential. And then, um, well, people are people and marketers uh, ruin everything as they say. So uh, it kind of turned into a shit show. And um, that's the way I would put it as being somebody on the inside. And also I'm, I tend to be a little bit more forthcoming and honest about things. I don't like to hide and sugarcoat things very much um because i i can take it i can take the truth uh but there's a lot of good things to say about it first of all i i started when the team was eight people i was the ninth employee oh, at mini chat okay. and it was uh eight russians is sitting in our garage or an apartment in moscow coding their asses off building a prototype and i was the first marketer growth business person they they hired none of them had ever run a successful business before they were all just kids in russia and it was amazing it was the it, the the energy in those first 6 months uh was just unbelievable it was just all optimism it was all hard work it was all just an unbelievable amount of dedication to the user experience and and things like that and i will say that one thing mini chat and the whole team there did very well was they were relentless about removing obstacles for their users. Uh, more so than a lot of companies that I've seen where the companies are focused on other things or maybe self-centered goals. Um, Minichat generally had a 
had a culture where if we can build something to make somebody's life easier, we're going to do it. And we're going to try to make the best user interface that we possibly can. And we're going to try to make the best tool in this space. And they're now the largest messenger marketing company. They in, we invented messenger marketing. I was one of the people who invented it. And uh, they are now the bigger, bigger one. They're bigger than chat fuel, even though chat fuel was bigger than us for a long time. So um, many chat is uh, by itself, one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of in my entire life. Um, but the thing is that Unfortunately, it uh, marketers and 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 Facebook kind of uh, got things mixed up, got priorities a little mixed up, and unfortunately, um, that beautiful one-to-one -one experience was exploited for its intimacy and sure. was used for a lot of things which were boring, spam, and in some situations, terrifying, like political manipulation. I personally witnessed attempts on our platform to sway elections in Central Africa and Ooh. in Pakistan. So I I saw some things there as many people who would go through this process of being anywhere near Facebook would see, which is that unfortunately there's something fucked up about it. And not, not many people know how to talk about it because it's really mysterious. The closer that you get to companies like Facebook and Google, the deeper that you get into the like network effect of things, you start to realize that there's something distinctly strange going on where it's way too powerful it shouldn't be as powerful as it is it shouldn't affect people so directly and the russians may or may not have affected our election it sounds like maybe they did um but the point is that they targeted facebook for a reason they targeted this platform as a reason for swaying people's mentalities and um, I'm not an expert in these kinds of things but I've witnessed it happen in real life and I'm completely convinced that um platforms like Facebook um, do more harm than they do good. I'm just going to say it very plainly. They do more harm than they do good to societies and to individuals and to um, health and wellness and mental health specifically. And the reason why that is, is actually very simple. It's not some, it's not that Mark Zuckerberg's an evil person. I had lunch with him once uh, right around when they bought Oculus and he's actually a very interesting person, a very well-spoken, thoughtful person. He's a total weirdo, but most techies are, most techies are extremely weird people. So um, like, it's one of these kind of situations where there's no there's no evil eye in the sky that's making things bad. What the real issue here is that the world is more networked than it's ever been before. And Facebook <laughs> and big companies like Facebook, like Google and Amazon, they are built upon one fundamental premise, which is that they have to sell your attention to quote unquote advertisers. That's the whole model is that they don't exist unless they can sell your attention to somebody else who wants to pay for them to influence you. So if you are sitting in Jamaica and you're trying to buy Facebook ads, you're paying Facebook to capitalize on the addiction of a lot of people to their platform to pay attention to what you have to say above others. You're competing for other people's attention and you're paying them a little bit of money to do that. But fundamentally, you're actually kind of capitalizing on a bunch of people's addiction. And um, that could be okay. Uh, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. It's, it, there's nothing to say that an alcohol company is Ill, is is um, immoral for selling alcohol because many of their customers are alcoholics. It's, it's it, don't, don't make it a moral issue, but you have to know the game you're playing, which is that the entire game is built around addiction. And when you have addiction, you have impulsive behavior, number one, and you have polarization, number two. And without those two factors, you could never have a Facebook. Facebook wouldn't ever make any money. So Messenger was a very strange part of that whole equation because overall, when we were doing ManyChat, the conversation at Facebook was about data security. What happened with um, Cambridge Analytica was a really big deal. And the thing is that that was about APIs we weren't using. So there was a lot of attention on things that weren't Messenger during that time, okay? So Messenger got a free card and a lot of people were able to do things on Messenger that were not okay. Mm -hmm. But they got away with it because the conversation wasn't about Messenger. And I'll tell you how much this is true just anecdotally and you can ask around, you can try to find some stats of your own. But mm -hmm. I, did an I did an informal study 
during my time at ManyChat. And um, the, the question was, do people who use Facebook Messenger know that it's a Facebook product? And it's a strange thing to ask, right? Mm -hmm. But as a matter of fact, 79% of the people that we surveyed didn't even know that Messenger was a Facebook product. So there's, there was a very strange kind of um, miscommunication or something, whether it was strategic or not. It, who knows? But the point is that people were leaning on Messenger to talk to their grandma in Kentucky. And Facebook let marketers loose on a channel that was intimate and full of natural connections. You're mm. trying to date somebody, you reach out to them on Messenger, you're trying to get hired somebody, you, you find them on Facebook. You, you want to talk to your grandma, she's got a Facebook Messenger account, but they don't even know that it's Facebook. So um, here's the point. Facebook gave away too much too fast, in my opinion. Marketers took that data, went crazy with it, realized that it was just a bunch of free value they could get from Facebook and just use it to retarget people for ads at best and at worst just to spam strangers. So um, that sucks. Um, It sucks for a lot of reasons. The first two years of, so I I was there for two years and I, I was part of the reason why it grew so fast. So I spent, I've spent the last two years reconciling that in myself, knowing that um, I wasn't the reason why that company grew. No one person is the reason for anything, but um, I'm really good at what I do and I helped that company grow. And it was incredible how much it grew. And looking back, I don't know if that was good or bad. I don't know if that did more good in the world or bad. And that's been a hard thing for me to come to terms with. Um, Overall, I'm very glad that I was part of that project. It taught me a lot. It gave me a lot of credibility. Um, you know, the work that I'm doing now couldn't be possible without the, you know, standing on the shoulders of the work that I did before. So I'm just extremely grateful that I got to do that. But um, I'm not sure that uh, that was all for the best. And the thing about Messenger is um, it is a Facebook property. <laughs> whether whether you want to believe it or not, it's a Facebook property. And Facebook's business model is... Um, getting paid to manipulate you so that you change your behavior in subtle ways over time. And they can do that so predictably that they can sell that to advertisers, whether you want to believe that or not, it's, it's not, it's just empirically true that this is how the system works. So um, my, my question to you is basically um, if you use Facebook products and if you are a business that relies on Facebook products, do you want to be the kind of person who's relying on manipulation to get your next customer? And if you're okay with that, there's no more. There's nothing morally wrong with it, but there could be something ethically that you could look at there and say, "Am I the kind of person who wants to be completely reliant on manipulating other people just to get my my thing in front of them?" There's other ways that you can do marketing. You know, there's this old thing called email marketing, which works really well. There's this other thing called content marketing, which is much harder to do these days because it's so scary and crowded out there, but it's still doable. Um, good products also speak for themselves and um, there's a lot of opportunity in local marketing as well. So my point, my point to you is this many chat was this fascinating project that was re- it made a few people really rich. And it again, concentrated power in a very small group of people who got on early and knew how to use it. But um, much like anything that's that, that requires addiction to work, you get hooked on it. And if you get too reliant on it, then you might have some problems. A lot of people now are saying, holy shit, I shouldn't have invested so much in this because um, now all the all the privacy rules are catching up. Mm-hmm. This, these new amendments to GDPR and, and also the, um, the the this privacy shield thing that just got wiped out. I mean, that's yeah, a, good- a few weeks ago, the, yeah. all the messages yeah. in the uh, European Union gone. Yeah. Yeah. Frankly, frankly, this is a good thing. It's shaking yeah. the system up because we've had this free period where there was no accountability in this space. And now suddenly people are like, holy shit, like you can just message someone for free, basically, without any solicitation at all. Like, that's crazy. And so that's honestly, guys, it, a lot of people are upset about these new changes, but this is actually the right thing. This is the system learning from its mistakes and trying to correct them. And unfortunately, human beings are really messy. And when they realize something has gone too far, they often go, oh shit, and they stop immediately and they go way too far in the other direction. I I encourage you all to not panic if you're really reliant on this channel. 
just take a breath and realize that when things swing the other way, they'll swing back. And uh, finally, we'll, as they vibrate, the, we'll find an equilibrium where it's not hard to message people anymore, but it's also kind of a little bit harder to spam them. And that's better for everybody. It's better for everybody. So just uh, weather the storm, um, learn how to be less reliant on Facebook, Google, and Amazon. That's the strategic goal for uh, the businesses that I work with in 2021 is to be less less dependent on those things. Um, because those companies have their own thing going on and you're just one small part of it. And um, uh, they're making a lot of decisions for you if you're relying on them. And my, my, my point is uh, a lot of people in America, especially they, we talk about freedom in this country. We love our freedom, but we have no idea how much of our freedom we give away to Facebook, Google, and Amazon every month. Yeah, like, probably uh, true. Yeah. We're worried about people taking our guns, but we've given our souls away. So here's my point. Um, you can be smarter and you don't need Facebook, Google, and Amazon to make a successful business. You just don't. And they want you to believe that you do need them. And it makes it a lot easier, um, but there's other ways you can do it too. Yeah, yeah I think um, a lot of what you said is absolutely true. And um, I have a kind of schizophrenic view on, on the whole social media thing, because I think personally, from, from a personal uh, point of view, that social media um, yeah, does a lot of harm to society um, because it kind of yeah, preys on, on weaknesses that we have um, as humans. And I personally, um, besides from yeah, the, the business use of social media, um, yeah, don't really see the sense of posting my private stuff uh, to the world. Um, but um, besides from that, um, on the other hand, um, I see the results that you can get with um, yeah on, on a business side. I can see the results, or that it's often only the only way for a lot of businesses um, to to getting um, new customers, the name up there, whatever. And it can be um, very effective, as you said. Yeah. So um, for me, it's the question. In the or, short term, yeah. they can. Yeah, be. In, in the short term, and then that's also why we, um, yeah, as you said uh, earlier on, and we also do that. Recommend our clients uh, diversify, don't rely on one channel. Um, have yeah, different uh, yeah, distributions or, or marketing channels that you can rely on. Yeah, um, of course, email, email marketing, as you said. Um, so, right. what, or may, maybe you can share a little bit. Um, I don't know how much you can share. What would you say? What would be then? Or was in when when you grew ManyChat through that that phase, and as you said, it was a yeah really really fast um, growth period. Are there specific things that you would point out um, from a strategic, from a from a tactical perspective that you yeah. did that you used to to yeah to get to grow the customer base to also keep the customers? I think that's again in, in a subscription business extremely important. Mm. And also that you would yeah with 2021 uh, coming up, I think a lot of trends accelerated, especially uh, yeah digital use of customers, things of that yeah, nature. Sure. Um, so yeah maybe we can or you can share a little bit of your of your thoughts and experiences here. Yeah, certainly. Before I go on, I just have to say to the audience, if you hear some background noise, I live very close to a, a naval air station in Washington state. And so you might hear jets flying over. It might be very loud a few times. So I'm very sorry about that. Oh, um, no, I think no, yeah. I think that was that was totally fine. I think it's cool, cool. sometimes a little uh, brief, but I yeah, it's almost not, not hearable. No, the audio cool. is good. Yeah, good, good, good. So I'm going to put on my noise canceling headphones now uh, because it's very loud here. So just give me one second. Yeah, sure. Yeah, give us some feedback, guys, um, if you have any problem with the audio um, or the video. But um, I can hear and see yeah, no and that's loud and clear. Okay, perfect. So, um, great. Where did stop? Yeah. So you're back? So, okay. uh, so let's just uh, let's reframe it. Um, st strategy about mini chat. So um, one thing I want to tell you is that there's no magic bullet for um, <laughs> growing companies. Um, if there is one, it, it's already been figured out. And it was figured out a lot a long time ago. And people like Jeff Bezos early on in his company were excellent practitioners of this concept. But um, 
the the real magic is you have to be obsessed with helping your customers succeed at whatever whatever it is that they're trying to do you have to help them get to that moment of progress faster and if you can help people make progress faster towards that goal whatever it is and you have to clearly define what their goals are if you don't know what the goals of your customer are you're going to have a really hard time selling anything to them but um, he was just absolutely relentless about this concept from the very beginning. You have to be obsessed with your customer and you have to know everything about them and why they're doing what they're doing and what matters to them in their life. And if you don't know those things, um, if you grow, it's going to be just out of luck. You know, that's kind of how it's going to work. So many chat. Um, I was lucky at that point. I'd already learned this lesson that you have to be obsessed with uh, who you're working for. And um, I took the time. I mean, I really did take the time. And I'd already been working in marketing for a while. And I understood what a marketer's workflow looked like, especially a successful one at a successful company. So uh, I advised, you know, how, how we should build the product. And, you know, I, I helped point us in the right direction. And um, also, when you're talking about something like ManyChat, the, the, the real value of ManyChat was more than anything, it's timing and it's closeness to a really important network, which was Facebook. Facebook already had, you know, 3 billion people or some some crazy amount of people using mm. the platform. And it was like, um, when you're close to those kinds of networks, you have a privileged position in a networked age where everything is networked. If you're close to the person who owns the network and you can have proprietary good access to the network, you have an advantage just by doing that. So that's number one. <laughs> Number two is um, uh, I learned a long time ago that you don't want to be in the business of changing people's behavior. If you want to change people's behavior, you should go be a psychologist. You should go be a self-help person uh, and you're going to fail, but you're, you're going to fail on your own terms. If you're, if you, if you're trying to sell a product um, that's designed to change people's behavior, um, you're going to fail. And if you and if you succeed, it won't be for the reasons that you think you're succeeding, because people people don't buy things rationally, and that's one of the things that uh, it took me a long time to really understand, is that you would think that somebody who's really overweight would be buying um, an ab workout machine because they want to lose weight, right? They want to get healthier, and that might be part of their motivation. But you know what they really want? They want the people in their life to perceive them as doing something about their problem. Those are completely different motivations. Like getting getting the health milestones is work. But buying an ab workout machine and showing people around you that you're taking it seriously for a moment is that satisfaction. And uh, that's the, usually the end of the transaction. They don't mm -hmm. end up healthier. We don't end up getting healthier. We just bought the ad machine because it makes us look like the kind of person who would get healthier. Do you see the distinction? Yeah. It's yeah. Like so, people quit after they uh, joined the, the membership, the gym, uh, the gym membership after three yeah. months. I think that's, that's the average or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. 90 days in the United States. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So my, my point is this, that, that that's not an isolated issue. We all actually make purchases that are more or less influenced by this motivation, which is we want to be perceived by other people as doing the kind of thing that we're doing. <laughs> and, and that's a very strange way to look at sales, but it works incredibly well. It works astonishingly well. The, the moment that I switched my mentality from people are rational and buying things of utility to people are irrational and buying things to be perceived as somebody who's doing something, uh, that was when my career took off. And when I look at other people who've done similar things, they figured this out too. And that's why good copywriting works the way it does, because you're selling a dream. You're selling a story. So the story that we were selling at ManyChat was that you could, with basically no technical ability, create something um, that was automated and could beat email marketing, which is something that a lot of marketers have been trying to get right for a long time. And, you know, open rates are bad and deliverability is bad. So marketers um, are people. And... Um, When their campaigns failed, they would say it was it's because the email tool doesn't work. It's because our email sucks. It's, it's half these messages aren't getting delivered. 
deliverability. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what I'm, what, I guess, what I'm getting at here is a lot of marketers, frankly, were looking at um, the the landscape and saying, "What I'm doing isn't working so well, or it's working okay, but we need we need a new channel." Messenger is amazing, and these bots are the future. We want to be part of the future. We want to be closer to Facebook. There's a lot of marketers who idolize Facebook because Facebook is this magical source of traffic and you just pay money to it. And that gives you money back. If you do the right, if you press the right buttons, it gives you a bunch of money back. And um, so that, that was kind of the dream that we were selling. And that was very strategic. That wasn't something that I was just like, God, oh, this is happening. We positioned it that way. And um, it was a very aspirational purchase. Um, and the thing is that um, it worked really well to grow really fast. And the way that you grow really fast like that um, is you have to get involved with networks, other networks, who want to believe that story. And to put it very bluntly, the, the digital marketer group, that whole group of people, was they, they sell a lot of courses. They sell a lot of these aspirational aspirations and stories to a group of people already. They do an, Are you talking about Ryan, Ryan Dice and when Ryan, you mean Ryan Dice. Yeah, okay. yeah, these people. And I have a lot of love for Ryan Dice. I really appreciate his mentorship early on. And he was very generous to let us borrow his audience like that. Um, and uh, th those conferences were, those first two conferences were just so fun because no one had ever heard of us. And then suddenly everyone heard of us and everybody wanted a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, we, the first two years at Traffic and Conversion Summit, which is like one of the biggest marketing conferences in the world. Um, the first conference that I went to with uh, ManyChat, we we didn't pay for sponsorship or anything. Actually, we didn't even pay for our tickets. Digital Marketer sponsored us. And um, we never paid for sponsoring or anything. And we were, we were in every talk on stage that year in some capacity. Everybody was just like, holy shit some like look at this thing you can do um and that was amazing and, and that was part of it was just luck of being in the right place at the right time but a lot of it was very strategic that's how i operate i try to find networks which are already which already believe what i believe what 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 what, what the, the belief system that we're selling they already believe it mm -hmm. uh what did i what did i say when i started is you don't want to be in the position where you're selling you're trying to sell somebody changing behavior yeah. because um, that's not the way to go. Uh, let's give you another example of this. Oh, it's very loud. Wim Hof. You guys know the, the name Wim Hof, yeah? Oh, the, yeah. The, I, actually, I, I started his breathing technique a few days ago just yeah. Uh, yeah, to give it a shot. Yeah, the Iceman. His mm. stuff is probably some of the most important fitness and mental health content available today. It's probably more to the core of how we need to start taking care of ourselves than almost anything else in the world. And probably 97% of the people who buy his book are never going to put any of that stuff to practice. Uh, why is this? Uh, you would think looking at his book, he's, he wrote a book to try to change people's behavior. He wants people to be happier. He wants people to be more robust and healthier and live longer, which is a huge behavioral change. So is he really selling behavior change or is he selling the idea of behavior change <laughs> so here's my point is that um wim hof is gonna do really well with this book he just released um all of his stuff has done really well on the internet and he's doing just fine he's got a compound that he lives in a beautiful house um full of all kinds of treats that he loves and uh 90, probably 97% of the people who ever interact with his brand or any of the stuff that he uh, does will never change their behavior. So he's not selling behavioral change. You know what he's selling is the identity of, uh, especially to young males. Young white males love Wim Hof because we were a little insecure about ourselves. And we, we look at this older man who's just like, he's ripped and he's so tough and he's like smart and he's like psychedelic and crazy. Um, and we're just like, I want to be like him. <laughs> it's like the obsession with Tim Ferriss a few years ago. It's the same thing. You know, look at this guy. He's just like this. Uh, he's, he, he knows so much stuff and he's in shape and he's just like so cool. He's invested in Airbnb and oh my God. Um, we're, 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 what you have to understand is the people who buy into these programs are buying an identity more than they're buying a practical outcome. And, and if you understand that you've found a key to marketing 
that is incredibly powerful because it can be abused. Uh, and also uh, a little bit sad, the fact that so many people feel so insecure and we feel like what's really going to get us to the next level is a Gary Vaynerchuk podcast. What's, what's probably going to get you to the next level is opening your heart up and being a little intimate with somebody, being more honest with somebody, learning how to communicate with your, with your loved ones a little bit better. Like those are the things that are actually going to make a huge difference in your life. But we trick ourselves into thinking that we can change our lives simply by consuming. So this is to take this back to ManyChat, 85% of the customers at ManyChat were people who were micro, they weren't even businesses. They were people who wanted to be the kind of person who would be perceived as a business person. Does this make sense to you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Who, who just like, you know, I want, I want to be known as an entrepreneur. And entrepreneurs use many chats, so I'm going to use many chat. Um, you, you see this in a lot of consumer applications. And fundamentally, we were a B2B, but maybe 25% of our customers were actual businesses, in my opinion. The rest were these aspirational people who their heart was in the right place and they just want to like take things to the next level, but they really have no competence in what they're doing. Um, they have no plan, but they think that mini chat is going to be this magical thing that ties it all together for them because they are in the hype cycle. They're, they're really, they're very emotionally charged. They're they're They just learned about marketing and they're just stoked. They think that it's this, the, they're going to solve all their problems. And mini chat is this thing that, made marketing look really fun and easy. And um, yeah, that's how you get 750,000 users in two years by tapping into those emotional loops that people get themselves into. Now, we had some great customers. We had Versace as a customer, for example. We had some very big businesses, some small businesses that were very successful. Um, Ezra Firestone was a customer early on. I work with Ezra now. Uh, it's my day job. So it's like um, we had some really fantastic people doing some really cool stuff with Messenger. And uh, it wasn't all just people kind of fumbling around. It was actually some really cool stuff too. But a vast majority of the customers were just aspirational kind of entrepreneur types. And you'll see, and we're not unique. I mean, you know, going back to MailChimp, when I was at ConvertKit, we were competing with MailChimp. I mean, we calculated that like 87% of their customer base was not even active, probably. Like they probably had a few big whales that were, floating them and a lot of a lot of accounts that were paying month to month but not even using it so um like a lot of SaaS businesses you'll find and a lot of software businesses in general um, have weird economics they have a, a few customers that pay them a lot of money every month and a vast majority of the customers either don't use it or don't really get a lot of value out of it and um i'm sorry to be speaking so f i'm a little bit sorry to be speaking so frankly about this but this is the reality of a lot of businesses i'm mean, gonna i think that's that's yep. super valuable i think because i think uh, yeah that that's what people need to hear um how yep. the, yeah how the world and the reality is absolutely yep. so that's kind of that was the story of mini chat and mini chat raised uh an 18 million dollar series a right at, like so i left at the end of 2018, I started at the end of 2016. So I was there for two years. And okay. we saw we saw that remarkable growth over those two years. I left the night of the conference. So we did our first conference, conversations conference in um, Austin. And it was amazing. Uh, Mike, the CEO, came to Portland with Molly and uh, Lindsay. And we sat at, uh, we were at WeWork. <laughs> and Mike sat there at the other end of the table and he goes, guys, I wanna have a conference. And I think this was in July. <laughs> and he was like, guys, we need to have a conference. I want it to be in October. And I want it to be the best conference anybody's ever been to. What do you need, what do you need to get this done? <laughs> and I looked at him and I was like, uh, not me. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> There's no way that we can do a conference by October. There's no way. But um, Lindsay and um, Molly Pittman, and they were sitting there and they're like, we could do this. We could make it happen. And I wanted to kill Molly. I was just like, you cannot, you can't be serious that you're going to commit to getting this done. And God, she got it done. I mean, she just took the reins. Uh, we had an amazing event manager, Sherry Sokolowski. She's just so good. Um, we had uh, a lot of help. And that conference was a, was a thing for me where I knew that that was the high point. I realized we had gotten this far. I had taken this company to 750,000 users in two years. It was the biggest thing I was ever going to do. 
And um, out of just a sense of gratitude and humility, I was just like, you know what? I did it. Like I've done everything I can for this company. Um, I, I could also see where things were going with Messenger and realize that that was not a path that I wanted to go down anymore. So uh, it was a it was a it was one of the most mature decisions I've made <laughs> as an adult to just say, you know what, this is it. Um, I don't need this anymore. They don't need me anymore. Um, they're going to take this success and take it forward. They raised the Series A um, from Bessemer, which is a really prestigious firm, and uh, pivoted and did their, their thing. So, um, yeah, that's how the mini chat thing happened. Well, I think that's definitely yeah a cool story. Yeah. And as you said, I think a very uh, smart uh, decision at, at that point. Uh, yeah to jump or to to go yeah. for something something else so how is then um yeah and then for or maybe you can you can talk about that um for people who don't know so how then did the the whole thomas and and uh, even if you said okay messenger with many jet um or it, it went in the wrong direction or maybe not not uh, as as you thought it should go so how came then that or came then that he said okay let's build another messenger and uh, yeah. maybe have a different approach yeah um so uh, you you'll enjoy this story after i left many chat my wife sharon and i um said you know we're let's get out of the country for a while so we actually moved to germany we were in germany for almost six more we were there for a while And uh, mm -hmm. we moved all around Bayern, which is the southern part of Germany, which I love. Uh, that's where all the good beer is and all the good food and uh, good roads, too. My God, I was we, we drove everywhere. It was just such a delightful time where I got to take a lot of time away and kind of just start to process what had just happened over the last two years. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I kept coming to during this time Uh, of being out of the United States and away from the craziness here, just like in a very calm, wonderful, very old place, which is Southern Germany. Um, if there are water fountains in Southern Germany that are older than our entire country. So like, you know, it's a different kind of uh, vibe there. And I think that the calm brought some really important things to the surface for me. And one of the principles that kind of bubbled to the surface was um, I was in a lot of pain about the fact that throughout this industry that we work in marketing and all that stuff and venture capital and, and uh, so the, the science of, of some of the math that we're doing now with artificial intelligence and everything else. There was one thing that was happening that I just couldn't reconcile. I couldn't, I couldn't be okay with, excuse me. <laughs> and that thing is we keep trying to engineer human beings out of the equation. Mm -hmm. With ManyChat, the value proposition was you could you could put this stupid bot onto your website and you wouldn't have to pay somebody to sit there. Like that was one of the most compelling value propositions to a lot of the medium-sized businesses we worked with, for example, which was you just plug this thing on and you just start getting money from the internet. You just put ManyChat on your site and you just get money. And I think that people really believed that that was how it worked. And and there was no people involved in that process. They just wanted this robot to sit there and talk to people or do whatever it did. And they just wanted to get, to get money. And that, I guess, you know what? It, it was that, that that whole value proposition kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. Because um, there was something a little bit dishonest in my mind about that. Because um, even the let's just say the best bot you could come up with on mini chat. The only reason why it was good is because it was slightly emulating a human, <laughs> you know, and there was something really sad about the fact that businesses value, um, removing people than they do enriching people and adding people. Like it's way more profitable to get a robot to do some stuff and kind of leave people out of the equation. Um, so like, I guess that was a reality that I had to learn to face was that there is an inevitable thing happening here in our world, which is businesses have the incentive to cut people out of the equation as much as possible. And I started to see this happening um, at ManyChat and realized that it's going to be even more poignant and more powerful once AI tools become really prevalent. 
So um, this is kind of what led me to what I'm doing now with, with my product, Thomas. And uh, what, I, what I started to realize is that there's an inevitability. Businesses want to pay robots to do jobs that humans used to do. And, uh, and, and that's including in the marketing department, by the way. So if you, if you think that you're safe being a marketer or a salesperson, uh, you're, not, you're not, I promise. Uh, so uh, I started investigating artificial intelligence platforms and technologies and specifically, you know, realized that there's really no such thing as AI. AI is more of a funding category than it is a, uh, an actual thing. But um, uh, be that as it may, machine learning is here and it's real and it's, um, it's, uh, it's removing jobs from the table every day. And I realized that there's no way that you can get ahead anymore without having a machine learning strategy in your business. Like it used to be, what's your mobile strategy? What's your social media strategy? What's your website strategy? Um, now it's, what is your AI strategy? And if you don't have one, it's almost too late. Like at this point, things are moving so fast uh, towards automation that uh, you need to get ahead of it now. Then that's, a, that's maybe another discussion. But um, that, that was the problem that I faced was, how is there a way to do this where we're being more honest about it? Like we're using robots, but actually they're doing a better job. Like, cause the mini chat bots that most of the mini chat bots that people built, um, they were maybe good at one thing or two things like getting a very specific outcome in a Facebook ad at best, but like, that's it. And um, so I thought, well, what's missing? What's missing in this equation? It's, it's a little bit of humanity. We need to build uh, a more natural language system a system which people can communicate with it. Uh, and if, the, if we're going to pretend like we're putting people in the queue, uh, let's actually build something that emulates a human a little bit better and is actually trained but more thoroughly and is trained to be better at what it does. Uh, and that's what Thomas is. Thomas uh, is kind of the culmination of two years of research that I did into natural language understanding and the whole paradigm of messaging. Uh, which I was very fortunate to take a couple years away from work and just do that research on my own. And Thomas is basically just a, a it's a it's a simple natural language understanding chatbot that lives inside of its own client. It's not a Facebook Messenger bot. It's not a Telegram bot. It just lives in a web chat client that you have control over. Um, so it's not dependent on Google or Facebook or Amazon to work. And um, he sits in the queue and talks to people who hit your website. And he's really smart. He understands a lot of different phrases. And, um, he can take you through a customer development and kind of a sales conversation. And he's really uh, good at coming back to the same topic over and over again. He doesn't break like other chatbots do when you try to talk to him. And he just kind of solves a lot of the problems that I saw with uh, many chat chatbots. Um, so it was a passion project. My wife and I uh, co-founded the company. She's the business manager. And I built the natural language understanding system and the, the logic and um, we are now in 12 markets in the United States. Um, so, and we bootstrapped, we did not raise any money to do this. So I'm, I, I said earlier in this conversation, if you can bootstrap, you should. And uh, I can say that with certainty that I'm very glad we didn't raise money, even though it would have been probably easier for me to raise money than uh, some other people. Cause I was involved in this industry quite a bit. Some people offered me money to do this, but we uh, did it ourselves. And I'm really glad that we did cause we got to build it the way we wanted to build it. Um, but the point is, uh, automation is absolutely a force of nature. Um, you're either going to be on one side of the automation curve or another. And I chose to bet on the fact that uh, if I built this network, this system that could have smart conversations with people, um, that it would become more and more powerful over time. And just in the short amount of time that we've been doing it, uh, it's certainly proven to be the, be the truth. So I'm uh, really grateful and humbled to be able to work on this project. Uh, it's a side hustle right now. I, 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 we just don't have the manpower or the, the will really to grow it really fast. But the data that we get every day from the conversations is really valuable. So um, we're refining the model every day. And it's a really fascinating project. It's ironically one of the most human projects I've ever worked on because um, we're trying to build something that fills a market need, which is people don't want to sit in their live chat all day talking to their customers. They just don't. They have better things to do. So we're giving the next best thing, which is a robot. And sadly, that's just the situation that we're in as a species. 
uh, it's now too expensive to hire people in the Philippines to do that job. So we're building something that's so cheap you can't say no to it, and it does as good of a job as somebody that you would hire in the Philippines. So um, that's the situation, and uh, that's where things are headed, guys, whether you uh, are willing to accept it or not. Okay, so let, let me play devil's advocate here for, for a second. Um, when it comes to like uh, speech recognition or, or things of that nature, I think like uh, software developers promise the end consumers in 20 years um, or when you call big companies and get into their phone lines that uh, yeah, yeah press the button here and they or they yeah don't understand you. Um, so what do you think or Again, I think me and, and most people listening right now are completely laymans when it comes comes to the uh, speech pattern understanding, AI, and, and things of that nature. Um, but why do you think, um, or what do you think are the reasons um, that now is the time where machine learning, automation, however you, AI, however you want to call uh, the, the thing that is happening, um, is now at that, I don't know, that, that, that quantum leap or that, that next uh, exponential step um, yeah. compared to 20 years ago where we kind of tried the same and uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question and I have kind of a surprising answer for you. And the answer okay. is that natural language systems aren't that much better today than they were 20 years ago. You know what they are? Is 20 or 30 times cheaper. Uh, because, okay. of Moore's, because of Moore's law, computational power keeps getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So we can use models that are just barely good enough. Like I have, I've spent over a thousand hours tuning our model and it, it gets barely 85% recognition. But as it turns out, 85% 85 rec 85 recognition is all you need if you're selling a really high ticket item, like what we're selling. Um, we, we work with uh, elective surgery clinics. So they're selling you know, $5,000 services. So all you need to do is sell two or three of those a month and you've done a tremendous value for the business. So that's the play we're taking. It doesn't matter that you can't recognize everything. What matters is that you can recognize the 80% of the conversations that lead to a good outcome. And that's the mentality that I would try to help you understand is that it's not about building duplex, which is what Google is trying to do. Like, it's not about building this amazing math, math, magical system that sounds like a human and does what a human does. What it's really about doing is making something that's a little bit better than a web form. <laughs> yeah, so you're not trying to, to get the Turing test done here. No, uh, who gives a shit about that? No, it's, it's not about being fancy. It's about understanding your customers well enough to know the 12 questions that they keep asking give them yeah. good answers and then get them funneled into a sales conversation. So it's, if, if, if I showed you what we built, you'd laugh. It's so simple. Uh, the, the, the speed, the, the natural language recognition is remarkable to up to a certain point, but the mathematics behind it, you could explain to a, a you know, a third grader in using metaphors and they would completely understand it. So my point is that a lot of the things that are happening in, in machine learning, the, Silicon Valley people, the, the techies want you to think it's some fancy stuff that's completely inaccessible and it's magic. But the thing is, it's really not. And it's really not even that intelligent. It's just that it's, it's intelligent enough and so cheap now that I can run these queries through a, a machine and pay almost nothing to get an output okay. and, then, and then actually produce a huge amount of value for a business. So is it then on a very, very simple level, and uh, again, don't hesitate to explain it to me um, like a third uh, creator. So, but is it then really not just more than, okay, try and error, but now we have so much computer power that we can try it so often in such a short amount of time that we can actually get the result um, that we want. I mean, you probably know these, uh, these figures that try to run and then you see the development, how they yeah. sometimes they develop completely new ways of, of walking just to get sure. the goal at the end of the, the ramp. Um, and then on the other hand, when I when I listen to podcasts like Lex Friedman, which probably uh, is, is a name to you, then it sounds incredibly complicated to me and, and we are so far away. So I, I don't again, I don't yeah. really understand the, the whole concept sure. behind it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's this, this is a man, we could do a whole podcast just on the topic of AI. Uh, I'm actually doing one, one of these with Jason Portnoy, hopefully, uh, just talking about the future of AI because it's such a funny topic. With um, who? Sorry, I, I missed that one. 
Jason Portnoy. He's he's just a, he's a business guy. He's got a cool podcast. Um, yeah. So I think the way that I would go about talking about this is that um, Silicon Valley and the the people who are writing grants to get AI projects funded want you to believe that it's magic. But um, the only reason they want you to believe it's magic is so that you don't ask too many questions and just give them the money so they can <laughs> research uh, and get funded for their silly projects. Um, machine learning and quote unquote artificial intelligence as it exists today is just a way of, it, it's just a, the, the, the real holy grail is that it can make some decisions for you without you having to be there monitoring it. And what I mean by that is, when you have to take some data, like you you see a, a, a text document and it's got a name in it and an email address and a phone number and it's got you know some somebody scribbled some stuff on it, um, a human being would look at that and say, okay, this is a name because it looks like this, and I'm going to put the name here. I'm going to tag it as name, and then this is a phone number, and I'm going to put it here in the CRM and tag it as a phone number. So a human being does these manual operations, these classification operations, where we use our intellect and our experience and say, this looks like this, so I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to give it structure and call it this. That's really time-consuming. That used to be called data entry, still called data entry. Well, the thing is that machines are way better at that, actually, because if you can train a machine on a pattern, it can do the same thing that a human can do in, in five minutes. It can do a 1,000 of those per minute. So suddenly you're, you're talking about an efficiency thing where it's just like, it'd be stupid not to use a machine to do this. So um, in the old days before traditional, like the machine learning models that we have now, we would create these really elaborate rules-based programs that would basically be looking for hard-coded patterns and things. And they weren't super accurate. Um, we could get them to be sometimes a little accurate where it would basically see a name 60% of the time and, and it would classify it as a name but there were some names that it would never get like uh, Southeast Asian names and Indian and Pakistani names or Asian names it would never get okay. so we had to figure out you know what I'm saying because it's just like how do you code uh, you know Savash Vrishvashvinyam how do you how do you code that so my point is we had to build something that could extrapolate a little bit it, 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 it could it could think outside the box just a little bit so in other words it's like <laughs> Uh, if it doesn't follow the exact pattern that you taught it, can it fuzzy match it? Can it say, okay, this kind of looks like something I've seen before, and I'm 80% positive this is a name. I'm not exactly sure. But then you build a thresholding thing, and it says, okay, if you're 80% sure, we're just going to say this is a name. What I just described to you is machine learning. Like Machine learning is basically just uh, a, a way of building algorithms, which are decision-making processes and things that are designed to run in a very kind of deterministic way okay. uh, to be able to interpret data a little bit more flexibly so that the input to the algorithm can be this or it can be this or it can be this, but those are all what we think are names. And if those are all what we think are names, then we can go to the next step in the algorithm. So that's all that machine learning does. Is it's, okay. it, the, the reality is machine learning is less like the Terminator and more like a bicep. It's like, if you wanna, if you wanna know how intelligent, the most intelligent machine learning mm -hmm. algorithms are, look right here. That, that's, <laughs> that's how smart it is. Your bicep knows to do this. Yeah. But if you tell your bicep to do this or this or this, it, it doesn't know what to do. So it's like okay. machine learning algorithms only work within a very drastically narrow scope of what yeah. you teach it to do. And it extrapolates a little, but it can't do it that, that much. Okay. Yeah. So, by the way, for everybody um, listening, um, you probably trained um, Google's AI and probably train it day by day um, when you see these little capture things and then you have to click on what is a car or what looks like a sign or whatever it might be. And uh, that's basically how you feed the AI and then give it uh, more and more data. So, and, and again, we don't need to get, go too deep into that, that topic, but where is then... Or is there at all a situation or a point or whatever of independent 
decision making of the system because right now it, it still doesn't sound or still only sounds to me okay put as much data into the system as you can get the more the better yeah. um and then the errors uh, get just smaller and, and smaller and if i have enough uh, yeah computing power behind it then uh, i can go to infinity but that still means i'm inside that box and i cannot the box cannot look outside the box and then yeah. make a decision by its own or that is yeah not predicted by the coding from the beginning or am i right. wrong here am i thinking yeah that's a really good question and i'll give you a very concrete example um one of my favorite video games of all time is starcraft 2. i don't know if we have any gamers on the channel right now but uh i love starcraft 2. i'm terrible at it but i've been playing playing it for like five years and i got competent at it after playing it for about five years i had no idea how much it took to just become competent at that game. And I love games like that, which you think you're good at it until you start playing people who are good at it. And then you're like, holy shit, I basically am a child. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. So um, StarCraft II is fascinating because the game rules of StarCraft II are very complex. It's unbelievably complex. And um, the thing that is most fascinating about StarCraft II is that uh, unlike other strategy games like chess, where you see the whole board, you see the whole playing field, you see what the other player is doing constantly, and you're constantly making strategy adjustments based on what you see. There is uh, there is a fog of war on the other person's map. You can't really see what they're doing unless you send a troop there. And if you send troops over there, they kill you. So you By the way, if you heard about the new Command & Conquer that they... That is... Uh, that is No? But but you know no, Command I mean, & Conquer, right? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I saw some, some videos of... What's the, the name of the, the red guy... The bad guy. Yeah, anyway, sorry, I never, I never after, yeah ch check it afterwards on, on YouTube. Um, I think they bring a new version, uh, but sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's the okay. Fog of War, uh, yeah, you're right. They have, they have the Fog of War simulated where you don't know what, what is there. Yeah. Exactly. So there's a very, there's a very uh, significant part of uh, decision making that happens uh, when you don't know what the other opponent is doing. You have to kind of extrapolate based on the information you do have. And there are ways yeah. to get the information, but they're kind of fleeting, um, which makes it a very different game than chess, for example, even though fundamentally you're just trying to get more of the opponent's yeah. pieces so that but you win. have all the information. Yeah. With, but but you're not, you don't have all the information. So some really clever people built a machine learning algorithm that basically watched a lot of StarCraft videos, like shitloads of them, millions of them and watch the replays of people playing everybody from amateur just casual players to the grandmasters who play these games professionally like south koreans and things like that and um <laughs> the the machine ingested all that stuff and then um the algorithm kind of learned what works and what doesn't work and then they set it loose and um just to give you an idea they trained they trained it on like 35 years of content <laughs> In, okay. a, in a matter of two months or something. So they trained, like, th imagine watching... So 35 years of, of life experience, of, basically. Like, back to yeah. back, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and that one scene like, in Matrix where Trinity learns, what, what is he learning, the, the, the helicopter or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that was a very prescient illustration. Like, the Wachowskis really understood this concept yeah. of yeah. time dilation in computational systems. And um, it was such a beautiful example of it. And the mm -hmm. did such an amazing job with that writing. But that's what happened here is we can use, <laughs> we can train a machine how to do Kung Fu. Yeah, we can train a machine how to play StarCraft by by showing it 35 years of, of videos and we can, we can train it in, in a couple months. So you've got a 35 year grandmaster and that's how the game starts. Okay, so they put this thing, they set it loose on the best players in the world, and it basically never lost a game. And here's the really creepy part. This is going back to your concept of decision making. Well, there was some stuff that these AIs did in the games that no one had ever done before. So this is the part that's really creepy is um, you can teach your bicep to do this and get and get really strong but once in a while it'll surprise you it'll do something you don't really didn't really expect it'll be way stronger in one direction for some reason or it'll you know whatever it'll look really contoured on this edge 
for some reason. You, you didn't plan on it doing that, but it, it'll do that. And that's one of the that's one of the natures of the spookiness of machine learning is that in some cases, uh, the more complex the problem gets, um, if you give it enough time to train itself, you, if you teach it 35 years of moves in two months or whatever, and then you set it loose on some of the best players in the world, and then it learns even more from them, um, it might find some really novel ways to hack the system that you never would have thought of because it could see those levers. It could, it could see, oh, there's a button here that's hidden. There's something I can do here in the game that no one's ever done. And if I do this, I'm going to do this 10,000 times. <laughs> in my simulated world, I could do this 10,000 times and see how many, see if it'll okay. work. Mm -hmm. And on the 10,001th time it works, and it works really well. So it, it says, okay, the algorithm says it did work, but it worked by a huge margin. So let's keep trying to do that. So the machine itself seems to be making a decision. It says it, it would almost be as if it invented a new way of playing StarCraft. It, mm -hmm. and, and in some ways it did. Uh, and the, the creepiest part is that a lot of the grandmasters who play StarCraft now use the techniques that they learned from the AI. The AI. Okay. So we, we're, we're in a world now where if you train machine learning models really well and you put them in the real world, they'll actually teach you how to do a job more efficiently and can actually train people back to be better mm -hmm. at the game, which is crazy. I mean, that alone is the spookiest thing I've ever heard in my life. But the thing is, that it's really not that spooky. It's not really that magical. The machine is an optimization solving. It's, a, it's an optimization machine. That's all it is designed to do is to get to an outcome. And if you train it well enough on good outcomes, it'll find novel ways to get to that outcome simply because it has to. It has to figure out how to pull the block over here in the most efficient possible way. And if you give it 35 years of training in two months, it's going to figure out some creepy shit that you never thought of. Just because you never thought of it doesn't mean that it's magic and it made a decision. What it means is that you didn't have 35 years to train <laughs> True. to become a StarCraft master. So don't be taken up too much by the hype around machines making decisions because fundamentally all those things that it learned came from human beings. And this is the part, this circling back to the very beginning of this conversation about how we keep trying to cut human beings out of the equation. Modern AI, I'm going to say this very clearly, modern AI and machine learning is absolutely dependent on data that is derived from human behavior. <laughs> there is no machine learning without humans training the machines. So it's not like machines are magically learning tasks and then teaching other machines how to do them. That's We're not there yet. We don't have the computational architecture or the knowledge of how to do that yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll happen someday. And God help us if that ever happens. But the point is that human beings and machine learning and AI are absolutely intrinsically intertwined. Without human behavior to observe, AIs wouldn't be able to do anything. Therefore, we're building AI and we're building machine learning models in our own image. They're not some magical, godlike creature that's yeah, okay. We're building, we're, this is the Bible. <laughs> we're building, we're God and we're building children in our image. And that's something that we have to not lose track of is that human beings need to be part of the process and have to be part of the process. Otherwise, it's just nonsense. Yeah, it is interesting what you're saying because um, this kind of well, reminds me to what we were talking about uh, at the very beginning of it, about the the financial context yeah. a little more because in that area um yeah it's really started out with the algorithms and trying to building um yeah trading algorithms and um yeah to to beat the the system but at the end of the day what you saw or or what you see um even if you put more computing power behind it and you move the servers closer to the stock exchange and then all these tricks um at the end of the day a human writes the code for the software and the yeah. human and it, and it just accelerates and, and, and leverages the, the human flaws and the ignoring yeah. of risks and yeah. the um, go go full speed when when everything looks bright and all these um, things. So, um, yeah, it, it's interesting that you yeah mentioned that in when it comes then to to the machine learning and then and I know that's that's a philosophical question, um, but then OK, what what would you say, is there a difference or are we there yet between machine learning where I think we are right now, we can train and program uh, software or machines in a certain way and where starts AI, meaning artificial intelligence, knowing that we can't really identify, uh, 
uh, really uh, say what intelligence or even consciousness is in, in these kind of things. So again, we're getting a little philosophical here, but yeah. do you have an answer to that question right now? Yeah, I mean, it's my question is going to be disappointing because I don't think that these terms are well defined enough to even have an answer. I mean, True. what is AI? To your point, what is intelligence? My my definition of intelligence comes from an old metaphysics and mathematics um, uh, perspective, which is you know, into all that intelligence is is an optimization force. It's any optimization force. You know, something that I think is incredibly intelligent. Um, is is DNA. DNA is probably one of the most intelligent things that's ever existed in the universe because it's a self-optimizing system that perpetuates itself using hosts and uses biodiversity as a means of exploring its own reality. I mean, if that's not consciousness, I don't know what is. It's not consciousness in the terms of, eh, what am I going to eat today? And what am I going to eat on Instagram? <laughs> like, that's not, if you think that deciding what you're going to eat and what you're going to post on Instagram is consciousness, then maybe we just have a fundamental disagreement about what consciousness is. So sure. it, again, it's, a, it's, it's hard to say. Um, it, it, the thing about AI is that there's a distinct religious um, concept that comes to mind of transcendence, uh, of salvation, of redemption, that, that a lot of people who are obsessed with AI, even to the highest level, people like Ray Kurzweil, who... I think is one of the most brilliant people who ever existed. He invented some of the earliest algorithms that we use still to this day for music synthesis and things, but he's a fucking kook, that guy. I mean, he's absolutely crazy. This, I mean, it, he was in charge of stuff at Google. Like he shouldn't be in charge of anything. This guy thinks that we're going to download ourselves into computers and survive forever and things like that. And it's just like, um, that's absolutely nuts. And um, to perpetuate those kinds of myths is a, it's a religion at that point. And that's okay. If you want to believe in that religion, you're, you're not crazy. I understand we have to believe in stuff, but know that you're believing in a religion that isn't based in anything real. Like there's no evidence that that's how we even work. You know, um, I, 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 I served in the military. I uh, have a lot of friends who were killed in, 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 in Afghanistan. A lot of, it's very sad stories. Some people survived, but lost limbs and things. And I've talked to a few of them and uh, they still think they have their limbs. What does that say about consciousness when you lose a limb and you still feel it? Uh, the what phantom you, pain and then these kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also people who are born without limbs and, and who get prosthetics and start to have strange feelings. And my point is consciousness isn't as clear cut as we'd like to think. And it's far more biologically rooted than we'd like to admit. We'd love to think of ourselves as these spiritual beings that uh, exist outside of our bodies, but the real evidence is that we're these miraculous sensory organs that are aware of themselves somehow. And um, that's a beautiful piece of art. Every single one of us by that definition is just a unique, marvelous piece of art. And uh, I think it's a really fascinating attempt to try to recreate the human mind in, in by, by functionally creating it in a machine. But if you think about that, that's kind of nuts because if you're going to separate the human mind from the beautiful sensory organ of the body that we are, you're, you're kind of like cutting us in half. If you're just going to say, uh, the mind is only the part that we need to remanufacture. Yeah, yeah, okay. Actually, the mind and the body, the mind only exists because we have all these sensory organs that give us a sense of space and a sense of domain and a sense of reality. Something. You know, like a, a yeah. brain sitting in a, in a tube isn't a human being. You know, it might be part of a human being. It might be a really important part of a human being, but it's not a human being. A human being is the sum total of a lot of experiences and trauma and limbs getting cut off and a brain that evolves over time. And it's just, we are a continuum. Fundamentally, there's no other way to look at us. We are not a finite thing in space that's doing computation. We're not computation machines. We're something else. We, uh, there's no other way to look at us. Um, unless you want to be a religious fanatic and then you can think of us as magical automatons or something. But the thing is that we're way more complex and beautiful than any Silicon Valley nerd is going to be able to code into an algorithm. And uh, good luck trying to do that. I think it's a fascinating endeavor. But like, try, to, try to get back to reality a little bit and, and realize that raising a child is way more fascinating than trying to work on an AI. Uh, children learn so quickly and they love you back and they, <laughs> they have way more interesting things to say 
than even the most advanced AIs. And you have these people, <laughs> you have these people who are building AIs and not, not focusing on raising children. So my point is, you decide the kind of life you want to live. Just my, my, I'm begging you as just a person who appreciates you. Uh, learn the game you're playing and understand the game you're playing before you start committing too much to any belief system. And AI is just another belief system. And, and maybe someday we'll have computational architecture that can support something as complex as the human nervous system. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll be alive when that happens. Um, may, maybe quantum is going to be the answer. Uh, maybe something quantum plus biological is going to be the yeah. answer. But God, go have a child. <laughs> you want to build something fantastic in the world, go have a child. That's my, that's my, uh, my thesis. That's your advice. <laughs> Before you build an AI, try with a child. <laughs> try communicating and raising a child to be a good person. That's pretty challenging. Yeah. We definitely have to continue that uh, conversation uh, you know, on off screen uh, yeah, in, sure. in a minute. But um, before we do that, um, you mentioned earlier on that you plan with, with some clients and, and yeah, look ahead for 2021. Yeah. So um, maybe you can share the last yeah, few minutes. What are your yeah your plans, your your predictions, your marketing strategies for 2021 that you yeah. think, um, or maybe, maybe even from a personal perspective, um, yeah. that you think or preparing right now? Yeah, okay. Um, that's a cool question. And, um, you know, I am the first to admit that I'm a person of many uh, contradictions and hypocrisies. I'm a human being, unfortunately, and full of dichotomies. Um, I talked a lot today about inequality fundamentally about how rich people are getting richer and poor people are getting poorer and that's been the case for probably about 50 years and it's happened many times over in many other empires like america but right now it's very obvious that that's what's happening and in my opinion that's just going to get more accelerated over the next five years and um in 2021 my personal goal is to uh capitalize on that i have a confession which is that i I want a big piece of property uh, that my wife and I can live on where we're, we have the option to be isolated from the world a little bit where we can, we would like to raise a child. We'd like to raise some goats. Um, I can't do that right now because um, I have some more stuff to do. So my goal for 2021 is to capitalize on the rising inequality because unfortunately that's the game that we're all playing. Like you, we live in this weird market we have this uh, access to the market and we can compete in the market and you're either going to compete or you're just going to become irrelevant. And I'm choosing, even though it hurts me sometimes to play this game, to be as relevant as possible because that's going to get me to my financial goals quicker so that we can raise goats and, and a child. So <laughs> my, uh, the, the, this is very strate strategic on my part. And number one is the advice that I would give to anybody. And this is the advice I'm taking is Stop investing in things you don't understand. And I promise you, if you're invested in the stock market, you don't understand it. Um, a lot of the people who think they understand it, even the biggest hedge fund managers, uh, are, get it wrong once in a while. And they're really wrong. And then they sit there and say, oh, my God, I thought I knew what this was all about. So I would say that if you are considering getting into the stock market because you see it going up and up and up and it's crazy, rethink it. Really question why you want to do that. Because... Um, the dangers are bigger than they've ever been. You can win bigger than you've ever won, but you can also lose bigger than you can ever lose. So if you think that the only way to build wealth is the stock market, think again. There's other ways to do it. Um, so for me, it's going to be working on Thomas because I believe that Thomas is a, an amplifier and a leverage of human ingenuity. And uh, the more data we collect, the more powerful we're going to be. So if you can get close to a project where you're collecting natural data from people's behavior that you can use to train machines with, you might find yourself in a really good position when that data is really valuable to somebody who needs it to train a model. or Maybe you've trained a model of some kind that, that can mimic human behavior. So if you're not learning how machine learning works and how it can play into marketing and sales and customer support and all these things, 2021 is your year. If you don't want to get left behind, you need to have a machine learning strategy. You don't have to become a mathematician. You don't have to become some. I'm, I'm barely technical. Whew, good. 
you don't have to become an expert at anything. You just need to understand that, what the tools are, how you can use them. And um, if you can get that far this year, you'll be in a better position than 99% of the people out there who have no idea what's coming, which is a wave of automation that could disrupt millions of people and millions of jobs. And it's coming, whether you want to admit it or not. And a lot of economists aren't thinking of it, but it's happening. I'm seeing it happening. I'm actually part of it happening. You know, this business that I'm doing was profitable from day one, and I spent almost no money to build it. Um, there's other people who are going to figure this out too, and they're already figuring it out. So get close to a network. Uh, try to understand um, what data matters in a business and what data doesn't, and learn how to make that data nicer for machines to play with. My God, um, if you can do that, you're going to get really close to something that's like a gold rush maybe an oil rush over the next five years because that data is going to be used to feed machines to teach them how to do stuff. And that's the reality is that uh, inequality is only going to increase and you're going to be on one side of it or the other. And I, I'm, I'm sorry to put that burden on you, but the burden's on your shoulders. Like whether you're willing to see it or not, like um, things are accelerating beyond our control. Climate change is accelerating beyond our control. Um, political instability, all these different things. Like it's crazy. The world's kind of crazy, and you can either be a part of the part of the thing that's like you, you can either be in the business of changing people's behavior, or you can be in the business of capitalizing on existing behavior and doing what you can to affect your local community in a positive way. Um, you know, like what I would love to see for each anybody in your audience is to get a little bit of wealth so that you can give back to your local community because that's those are the people who need it the most. Um, patronizing small businesses, maybe funding a little project here and there. Um, you'd be surprised about how much you can do just by yourself by reaching out to somebody in need. Uh, and, and you don't need a lot of money to be able to do that. <laughs> you just need a little bit. And um, it would bring a lot to the world to have more people who have their basic needs taken care of so they can think ahead. <laughs> and help, help some people out around them. So that's number one for me is just focus on um, building something that's going to be close to a network that is going to grow in value over time. And I believe that being able to replace or at least augment human behavior in customer support, sales, and marketing, tens of billions of dollars are spent on that every year. And people like me are going to figure out how to automate huge chunks of that and we're going to make all those jobs go away and capture all that value for ourselves. You're competing against me and I'm pretty smart. So um, that's the goal for you is you need to be thinking smarter, not harder. <laughs> you need to be thinking about uh, things more strategically and long term. You need to be thinking two to three years ahead, not just about what's in front of you. And if you're worried about money, that's really hard to do. And I get it. If you're worried about where your next paycheck is coming from, it's hard to think about two months from now, let alone two years from now. Get yourself in a position where you can start thinking ahead because if you can't think ahead, you're going to get left behind. That's that's the dire warning that I'm going to give you for the next two years, but it's also an amazing um, opportunity for you to transcend and to rely on yourself and to be honest about the world and accept the world a little bit more and to give more of yourself to the world because that's what we need. Okay, then I have two final questions or question number one where could people get more of that or is there anything where you would point people at when they can learn more about automation especially in a business context when you say okay i'm a business owner in jamaica in the caribbean where should people start that maybe right now heard the first time about ai and machine learning and automation and all that stuff yeah so imagine asking that question 10 years ago or, or when the maybe when the first iphone came out There were a few people in the world who looked at the iPhone and said, this is going to change business. It's going to change consumption patterns. It's going to change everything. How many blogs were available talking about how the iPhone was going to change business the day that Steve Jobs dropped that iPhone? Maybe one or two. We're at the very beginning of something here. There are not many people talking about this. There are not many blogs who are sophisticated. There are not many people sophisticated enough to see that this is happening. Um, so uh, that's number one is be careful with the blogs that you read about this because most of them are just hyping up the religion of AI and they're not talking about the real practical implications of it. And this is some concrete advice for you. When you see something you've never seen before, it's because you're young. I've learned this myself is uh, I made uh, some strategic bets on the stock market 
earlier this year and they were fucking stupid. They were stupid. That I lost some money. I thought I had figured a lot of things out. And the reason why I thought I'd figured things out is because I'm young mm -hmm. and I didn't live through 1987. I was a baby in 1987. In 1987, something very similar happened in the stock market. Where, um, we thought it was going to go down. Like when, when the pandemic hit, I was sure this country was kaput. I thought we were done. I really was convinced the dollar was going to fail. I bought some securities that were basically betting that we were going to fail. And not only did we not fail, but we just have had the craziest, <laughs> the craziest growth in the stock market that has ever happened. Yeah. So here's my point. I'm speaking from experience here. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. And if you see something, you, if you start to feel like you do, you need to start looking elsewhere. You need to start looking to your elders. And this is the point. There were people around when the internet got started. And some of those people are still alive. And they saw this shit coming 20, 30 years ago. And it's all starting to come exactly as they said it would. So this is my this is my quest. I'm giving you a quest now. Stop listening to these young kids who have blogs. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. Go listen to people like Jared Lanier. Go listen to people like, uh, like go look up some of the earliest people who started doing stuff on the internet. Jared, Jared, Jared Lanier is kind of famous right now because he was in that movie, The Social Dilemma. And he's... He's, he's a big guy with dreadlocks. He's really fascinating. Um, he invented virtual reality, but he's been talking about this stuff for like 30 years. Go learn from people who are older than you, who are wiser than you, who have been around, who, who are part of the, st the strategy and tactical building of what you use every day, because they've been seeing this coming for a long time. As a culture, in Jamaica, maybe this is not the same as it is in the United States, but in the United States, we have dismissed our elders. We've learned as a, as a culture, old people don't know what they're talking about. And we've lost a respect for our elders. I think that that was a mistake. I think there's a lot of wisdom in older religions and things like that, that you should honor thy father and mother because they've been around longer than you have. And they've been seeing this stuff happen a lot longer than you have. They've, they've seen cycles in the world. You've only seen a few cycles if you're young. So my point to you is, where you can find the best information is not on the cutting edge blogs. Go read some books. You know, go read Marvin Minsky. Um, go read Jaron Lanier's books. Um, go, go read some of these books that were written 20 years ago because they were laying the foundational ideas about why everything's happening the way it is right now. Learn from history. And you can only learn from history by going to your elders, and especially if they're still around. Uh, I, would, I would definitely say start with Jaron Lanier because Jeremy, he's yeah, okay. so good at talking about this stuff. And you'll find that a lot of the things I said today uh, are mimicking many of the things that he's that he talks about. So um, definitely, definitely start with your elders and um, you'll learn a lot. Okay, and then last question. Um, yeah, as you said earlier, or I paraphrase it a little bit. Um, if you can beat them, join them. And you said you will outwork everybody. Um, so where can people find you? Can people reach out to you? And uh, yeah, learn more about you, your, your projects uh, that you have running and everything else. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this year I got off social media. I only have a Facebook account for work reasons, but I'm actually going to be deleting that soon. So. I'm not that easy to get a hold of. I don't have a website or a blog and I don't have a YouTube channel or a podcast. Um, I'm kind of quiet about the work that I do. I'm kind of unusual in that way in my industry. Um, I would say that if you want to have a chat, if you really think that there's something to talk about and you think that there's some interesting stuff, just shoot me an email the old fashioned way. Remember in like 1997 when you say, shoot me an email. You know, the good I'll, old days. I'll actually respond if you, if you have something interesting to talk about. And um, yeah, let's let's have a chat. Um, I uh, I'm working on something called Thomas AI with my wife. Um, it's we're not making it super public because what we're doing is we're trying to compete <laughs> and we're trying to get a lot of data before everybody else does. So I'm not going to tell you how we're getting it, but um, I'll tell you the strategy. Um, if you want to work through some ideas for your business, um, whatever it is, like uh, this time of year, especially, I love to try to do things like this and give back a little bit of time. Um, I have a very prosperous life because I've worked very hard and gotten very lucky. So um, I'm more than willing to give people in your audience time to shoot me an email. Um, and uh, the best thing to do is shoot me an email with a very specific ask. Like if you ask a really long winding question, I, I might not spend time writing back to you, but if you have a very specific question or you just want to touch base on a, on a, on a, 
on an item or two in your business, I'm happy to talk. Yeah. Is that fair? I think that's more than fair. Cool. So, um, yeah, thanks again um, for yeah, taking the more than two and a half hours um, by now. <laughs> And uh, yeah, talking about everything uh, and all the stuff. And I think it was very, very insightful for the audience. So um, yeah, um, again, thank you for taking your time. And um, yeah, goodbye, everybody. And see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.